Good evening and welcome to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Ah, yes. A nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are stakes on the table and beasts of burden by choice and consent. Do you fit that description? I certainly hope not. If you do, then it's time to wake up and change it. If you really want to know in a nutshell what's wrong with this country, go in your bathroom and look in the mirror. Everybody write this down. Write it down. Monday, March 15th. That's a Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m. to 11. The Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard, San Diego. That's Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m. to 11. The Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego. I'm going to be giving a lecture that night entitled The Sacrificed King, and I will prove to you beyond any shadow of any doubt that John F. Kennedy was assassinated by the religion known as Mystery Babylon, specifically by the arm of Mystery Babylon that calls itself the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. I will prove it to you folks. I want to see you. I want to meet you. I want to shake your hand. I want to see who my radio audience is. If you're a Taji member, I specifically really, really look forward to meeting Taji members. You are my heroes. You are the ones who do the dirty work, who are constantly digging out and sending in information. So if you're a Kaji member, I want to meet you. I want to see you. I want to shake your hand. If you're just a listener to this show, I still want to meet you. I want to shake your hand. I want to see you. And you're going to want to hear and see what I have to say and show you on Monday, March 15th at 8 p.m. at the Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego, California. The price of admission is $40. If you're a CADGI member, it's $30. CADGI members get a 25% discount to this lecture. Sometimes CADGI members get a bigger discount. But this is all I was able to negotiate with the promoters of this event in San Diego. By the way, I will be there all weekend. I will be there the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Actually, I'll be there the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. Uh, I'll have a room at the hotel. If you want to come earlier, I'd like to meet you. I'd like to sit down and talk to you. I plan on having some conferences with some good people, some patriots in my room. And you'll get to meet my wife and my little daughter, Pooh. They're both looking forward to meeting you also. So, please, put it on your calendar. Start saving your money. Make sure that you are there. It is important. Now, at the same time in this hotel, the National New Age and Truth About UFOs conference is going on. So, if you're interested in this nutty Looney Tunes stuff, uh, you might want to come down and go to some of that, too. Now, some of these speakers have something to say. Most of them, however, are as nutty as a fruitcake, and so is what they say. I know, I've been to many of these. I've talked to these people so many times, it's pathetic. I've sat in and listened to them, and you talk about lies and deception and just plain old bullshit. <laughs> you hear a lot of it at these conferences. But don't get me wrong, folks, because sometimes it's a lot of fun. I mean, sometimes Looney Tunes is just fun. Escape from the real world a little while and listen to some of these people. Most of the lectures are free. If you want to go to the workshops, that'll cost you. But most of the lectures are free. I mean, you sit there all day and listen to these people. And some of them have something to say. Most of them most of them belong in the loony band. I'm telling you right now. <coughs> My workshop is 8 o'clock Monday night. Something's wrong, folks, in America. Something's really wrong. Something is destroying everything that we've ever held dear in this country. What is it? Well, if you've been listening to this show, many of you already know what it is. If you've just been listening to the show for a little while, you may have some idea, but you're not quite really sure yet what's going on. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's all about religion. Whether you're religious or not doesn't make any difference. It's all about religion. 
Whether you believe in God or not, it doesn't make any difference. It's all about a big battle between good and evil. And the most of it, I can tell you, exists in the minds of men. Some of it's real. The question is, what's real? What's deception? What should we be paying attention to? What is it that's driving us insane? Yes, something is wrong in America. The sound you hear is dripping blood. This is the start of Black Sunday. Today's newspaper folks are full of stories about the rampant rise in divorce rates, the increasing abuse of children by some parents, increases in the incidence of rape, pornography being read by an increasing number of people, more crimes against property, demands for world government, urgings for national borders to fall, Christian churches being closed because they will not seek licensing by the state, etc., 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 and I could go on and on and on and on and on. But why? Why are these things happening? Why are all of the legacies of the past, the family, national borders, the right to practice any chosen religion, the right to private property, among other things, under such an attack? Is it possible that there are actually people and organizations who really want to change the basic order of things? Well, my regular listeners know the answer to that. Clues to the answers to these questions, folks, can be gleaned from some comments made by people and organizations that are talking about these wide-ranging changes in the nature of our lifestyle. An Associated Press Dispatch on July the 26th, 1968, reported this, quote, New York Governor Nelson A. Rockefeller says as president he would work toward international creation of a new world order, unquote. And you thought George Bush coined that phrase? Surprise, surprise. On January the 30th, 1976, a new document called the Declaration of Interdependence was introduced to the American people and it was signed by 124 traitors. 32 senators and 92 representatives, altogether 124 traitors in Washington, D.C., and it read in part, quote, Two centuries ago, our forefathers brought forth a new nation. Now we must join with others to bring forth a new world order, unquote. And you thought George Bush coined that phrase. Surprise, surprise. Another individual who has commented is Henry Kissinger, probably the greatest traitor this nation has ever known, former Secretary of State. According to the Seattle Post Intelligence of April 18, 1975, Mr. Kissinger said, quote, Our nation is uniquely endowed to play a creative and decisive role in the new order which is taking form around us, unquote. George Bush gave the commencement address at Texas A&M University on May 12, 1989. And he used similar words as well. His speech was on the subject of Soviet-American relations, and he was quoted as saying in part, quote, Ultimately, our objective is to welcome the Soviet Union back into the world order. Perhaps the world order of the future will truly be a family of nations, unquote. Historian Walter Mills maintains that prior to World War I, Colonel Edward Mandel House, the major advisor to Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time had a hidden motive for involving America in the war. The historian wrote this, quote, The colonel's sole justification for preparing such a batch of blood for his countrymen was his hope of establishing a new world order of peace and security, unquote. You see how these people fool themselves? <laughs> they always say that the end is peace and security, a world utopia. But to get it, they spill more blood than ever has been spilled in history each time they try to bring about their utopia. The blood runs in the streets. They're liars. They're hypocrites. They're manipulators, deceivers. They're the worshippers of Lucifer. Adolf Hitler, a socialist and the head of the German government prior to and during the nation's involvement in World War II, is quoted as saying this, quote, National Socialism will use its own revolution for the establishing of a new world order. 
unquote. Adolf Hitler was a socialist. Nazi means national socialism. Hitler confided to Hermann Roschning, the president of the Danzig Senate, quote, National socialism is more than a religion. It is the will to create Superman, unquote. And what is the number of the man? Six, six, six. You see, in the New World Order, only one man will be allowed to live. The new man, the illumined man, and the number of that man is 666. You will see that number increasingly all around you. You will also begin to see pyramids increasingly all around you, and the eye in the pyramid, and the eye alone. And you will see circles with a dot in the center. And you will see obelisks appearing all over the place. And these are not the only signs. There are many, many, many more. They are the signs of the religion of mystery, Babylon. Hitler added this thought, quote, Well, yes, we are barbarians, and barbarians we wish to remain. It does us honor. It is we who will rejuvenate the world. The present world is near its end. Our only task is to sack it, unquote. Another book on his background quoted his comments that his Nazi party had a hidden purpose, one that was not perceived by the world at large. Mr. Hitler was quoted as saying this, He who has seen in National Socialism only a political movement has seen nothing, for it is a religion. The Humanist Religion issued a manifesto in 1933 stating its beliefs about the world in general. It took the following position about the need for the wealthy governments to share their wealth with the less fortunate nations. It is the moral obligation of the developed nations to provide, through an international authority, economic assistance to the developing portions of the globe. Now that is a lie, folks. It means that it's okay for some of us to lay back and do nothing and reap the rewards of the labor of others. That's socialism. That's what it's all about. Communism, socialism, it's the same. And these people, the worshippers of Mystery Babylon, are the original communists. They are international socialism. They invented it. It is their creation. It is their dream of a world utopia. A one-world totalitarian socialist government. The April 1974 issue of Foreign Affairs, the quarterly periodical issued by the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, had an article in it by Richard N. Gardner, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations in the Lyndon Johnson and John Kennedy administrations, and he stated this, quote, We are likely to do better by building our house of world order from bottom up rather than from the top down. An end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, is likely to get us to world order faster than the old-fashioned assault. Unquote. Even the Communist Party is voicing similar thoughts. The People's Daily World for Thursday, March 9, 1989, contained an article written by Angela Davis. You remember her? Those familiar with Miss Davis will remember that she was the vice presidential candidate for the Communist Party a few years ago. She currently is a member of the National Committee of the Communist Party of the United States, and she is quoted in the paper as saying, quote, One underlying effect of anti-communism in this respect is to encourage a certain hesitancy to embrace solutions which call for deep structural socio-economic transformation, unquote. Another communist, Alexei Kovbulov, spoke at an evening meeting held at Windstar, Colorado, in August 1985, and gave the participants in attendance a surprise presentation. He spoke about the 12th World Festival of Youth and Students held in Moscow a few months prior to his lecture. He said, quote, There were three programs. The first was political and dealt with the various issues of peace and disarmament. The second was dedicated to environmental issues and to the new international economic order, unquote. The alleged need for a change in the basic way things are done is consistent with the teachings of the father of communism, Karl Marx. He's not really the father of communism, but it's a, it's a name that's been tagged onto him. You see, he was just a hack writer hired by the mystery religion of Babylon to write the Communist Monk Manifesto. It was not his idea, but he's reaped the benefits of it, if you can call them benefits. 
But he co-authored the Communist Manifesto with Frederick Engels, another hack writer, in 1848. Mr. Marx wrote that the Communists, quote, openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions, unquote. Nessa Webster, a writer on the subject of conspiratorial organizations in the past, wrote this in her book entitled Secret Societies, quote, The revolution desired by the leaders of world revolution is a moral and spiritual revolution, an anarchy of ideas by which all standards set up throughout 19 centuries shall be reversed, all honored traditions trampled underfoot, and above all, above all, the Christian ideal finally obliterated, unquote. Some of the Catholic popes in the past have commented on the major changes coming in the future. One such pope was Pope Pius XI, who wrote the following in 1937. Communism has behind it occult forces for which a long time have been working for the overthrow of the Christian social order, unquote. One of the popes who preceded him, Pope Pius XI, or excuse me, Pope Pius IX, wrote this in November 1846 about the changes that he saw in the future. Quote, that infamous doctrine of so-called communism is absolutely contrary to the natural law itself, and if once adopted, would utterly destroy the rights, property, and possessions of all men, and even society itself, unquote. Now, don't get all worked up about what the Pope says, because they have succeeded now with this Pope in putting one of their own upon the throne of the Vatican. It had long been their dream, and now... It is true. And the bans have been lifted against Catholics joining secret societies. Many of the hierarchy of the Vatican belong to the secret societies, the Freemasons, Propaganda too, etc., etc., etc. You will find an obelisk, <laughs> the symbol of the phallus, the penis of Osiris, in the Vatican courtyard. If you don't believe me, go look. Another individual who wrote about the future was Dr. Jose Arguelles of an organization known as the Planet Art Network. Dr. Arguelles wrote, quote, Also implicit in all these events is a call for another way of life, another way of doing things, a redistribution of global wealth, in short, a new world order, unquote. Now, just what the future society was that these people are talking about was described in a brief manner by Marilyn Ferguson in her book entitled The Aquarian Conspiracy, and she wrote this, quote, The new world is the old, transformed, end quote. Another clue about what is in store for the future world was offered by Dr. James H. Billington, who received his doctorate as a Rhodes, 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 Rhodes scholar, where have you heard that before? You have a Rhodes Scholar sitting in the Oval Office right now. He received his doctorate as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University and has taught at Harvard and Princeton Universities. He wrote this in his book entitled Fire in the Minds of Men. Quote, This book seeks to trace the origins of a faith, perhaps the faith of our time. What is new is the belief that a perfect secular order will emerge from the forcible overthrow of traditional authority, unquote. You hear that? They believe a perfect secular order will emerge. Nothing perfect will ever emerge from the minds of imperfect men. And no men will ever be ruled by other imperfect men in a, any kind of a perfect utopian order secular or otherwise. That is why we must be eternally vigilant. Eternally vigilant. That these future changes would involve force and slavery was confirmed by B.F. Skinner, chairman of the psychology department at Harvard University. In his book entitled Beyond Freedom and Dignity, Dr. Skinner has been called the most influential of living American psychologists by Time magazine. So the world should listen to the professor when he speaks. The magazine told the reader what the message of Professor Skinner's book was. Quote, we can no longer afford freedom, and so it must be replaced with control over man, his conduct, and his culture, unquote. Not long ago in the Los Angeles Times, there was an article called Ten Forecasts for the Coming Decade. One of these was chemical or elect 
electronic implants to control individual behavior on a 24-hour basis. Another student of these changes is Alvin Toffler, who wrote this in his book entitled The Third Wave. And you should read everything that he's written, by the way, because what he's writing is what is coming. Quote, a new civilization is emerging in our lives. This new civilization brings with it new family styles, changed ways of working, loving, and living, a new economy, new political conflicts, and beyond all this, an altered consciousness as well. The dawn of this new civilization is the single most explosive fact of our lifetimes, unquote. Another scientist involved in commenting upon the future changes was Dr. Carl Sagan, and he's observed this, quote, it's clear that sometime, relatively soon in terms of the lifetime of the human species, people will identify with the entire planet and the species, unquote. Now the reason, folks, why these changes are necessary was explained by Manly P. Hall, perhaps the world's leading authority on esoteric words and language. He was a 33rd degree Freemason. He wrote in his book entitled Lectures on Ancient Philosophy, quote, the time has not yet arrived when the average man is strong enough or wise enough to rule himself, unquote. And he explained who he considered worthy enough to rule those on the world considered by the experts to be incapable of governing themselves. He wrote this, quote, Never will peace reign upon the earth until we are ruled by the fifth. And who is the fifth? <laughs> Why, them, of course. The illumined, the priest of the mystery religion of Babylon. Mr. Hall even indicated that these changes would occur soon. He wrote this comment in his book previously cited, quote, 100 years ago, meaning in 1884, folks, it was predicted that within a few centuries men would revert to the gods of Plato and Aristotle. We may all look forward with eager anticipation to that nobler day when the gods of philosophy once more shall rule the world, unquote. Aldous Huxley, in his book called Brave New World, Revisited, quotes a character called the Grand Inquisitor in one of Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky's parables as saying this, quote, In the end, they, the people, will lay their freedom at our, the controller's feet, and say to us, Make us your slaves, but feed us, unquote. The Tucson Citizen newspaper of November the 3rd, 1988, printed a photograph of a group of people involved in a march for literacy, and it clearly demonstrated that at least some people in America are now asking their government to make them their slaves. The picture showed a demonstrator carrying a picket sign that read, quote, Uncle Sam, we want you to support us, unquote. Mr. Huxley gave us a date when we could expect these changes to occur. He wrote the following in his book written in 1958, quote, the 21st century will be the era of world controllers, unquote. And then he told us why these controllers would not fail. Quote, the older dictators fell because they could never supply their subjects with enough bread, enough circuses, enough miracles and mysteries. Under a scientific dictatorship, education will really work, with the result that most men and women will grow up to love their servitude and will never dream of revolution. There seems to be no good reason why a thoroughly scientific dictatorship should ever be overthrown. Unquote. Someone who might have given the world the date for the commencement of these predicted changes was Zbigniew Brzezinski, a Marxist, President Jimmy Carter's national security advisor during his four-year administration. And he wrote the following in his book entitled Between Two Ages, by the way. You should read every book that he's ever written. You will be angered. Quote, Either 1976 or 1989, the 200th anniversary of the Constitution could serve as a suitable target date for culminating a national dialogue on the relevance of existing arrangements, the workings of the representative process, and the desirability of imitating the various European regionalization reforms and of streamlining the administrative structure, unquote. And it did begin exactly when he said it would. So the people of the world can now determine what those changes are that those in the positions of implementing changes have in store for them. In summary, folks, these changes are. The old world is coming to an end. It will be replaced with a new way of doing things. The new world will be called the new world order. This new structuring will redistribute property from the have nations and will give it to the have not nations. The new world order will include changes in the family, the workplace, religion, 
the United States will play a major role in bringing it to the world. World wars have been fought to further its aims. Adolf Hitler, the Nazi socialists, supported the goal of the planners. The majority of the people will not readily accept the New World Order, but will be deceived into accepting it by two strategies. One, those in favor of the changes will have become seated in the very thrones of power, generally without the public realizing that fact, and this has already occurred. Two, the old world order will be destroyed piece by piece by a series of planned nibbles at the established format. The Communist Party is actively supporting the changes to the New World Order. The basic tenets of Christianity, which were the base for the Old World Order, will have to be eliminated. If the slower methodical techniques of change do not function, violence will be introduced and controlled by the planners, including possibly a World War III using atomic weapons. The people of the world will give up their freedom to the controllers because there will be a planned famine or some other serious occurrence such as a depression or war. The change to the New World Order is coming shortly, folks, and it has already begun. However, if that is not the case, it will be introduced one step at a time so that the entire structure will be in place by the year 1999. We've got to take a short break. Don't go away, folks. I'll be right back after this very short pause. The Fear will freeze you when you face it. The Mummy. Born from the darkest tomb of the pharaohs, it rises from the quiet dust of centuries to wreak a strange vengeance against mankind. The Mummy. It tears steel bars like paper. It snaps men's spines like matchsticks. Walks through bullets like a ghost. <laughs> It sees without eyes, it lives without breath, yet its desires are strangely, madly human. The motion picture screen's most shocking experience in suspense, in killing Technicolor. The Mummy. Yes, folks, something is indeed wrong in America. And many sense that changes in this nation's lifestyle are occurring. Most of us know full well that these changes are taking place. The newspapers are saturated with articles reporting the activities of those advocating increased governmental spending for a variety of unconstitutional purposes. Organizations supporting a globalism concept urge the world to adopt a one-world government. Psychologists preaching the destruction of the family unit and recommending that the society rear the nation's children. Governments closing private schools and nations forming regional governments under which national borders are scheduled to disappear. And still the sheeple think that all of this is happening by accident. And any concept that it is being brought about by a carefully orchestrated plan is the product of crazy conspiratorialists. Mm-hmm. Since these changes appear to be part of the new philosophy known as the New World Order, anyone desiring to know the future has to become familiar with this new phrase and what it portends for the world of tomorrow, and you will quickly see that it is the result of a well-thought-out, well-conceived, and well-orchestrated plan. Indeed, it is called the Great Work. As an indication that major changes are coming in tomorrow's world, one of the current trends mentioned is the call for a one-world government. And one of those supporting this leap forward is Norman Cousins, president of the World Federalist Society. And he's on record as saying this, quote, World government is coming. In fact, it is inevitable. No arguments for it or against it can change that fact, unquote. And I say that is a lie. 240 million Americans standing up in concert with each other, holding a rifle in their hands, and stop it instantly in its tracks. And that's the truth of why we were given the second article in amendment to the Constitution. It has nothing to do with hunting or preserving your private property. It has to do with preserving our freedom. The goal of a one-world government, folks, is not a new thought. One of the earliest formal organizations that supported the concept of that goal was the Illuminati, 
founded on May 1st, 1776 by Adam Wise Hopp, a Jesuit priest, a professor at Ingolstadt University, a Jesuit university, a teacher of canon law. Professor Wise Hopp was quoted as saying this, quote, it is necessary to establish a universal regime and empire over the whole world, unquote. Now, let me tell you the truth about the Illuminati. Adam Weishaupt did not establish the Illuminati, nor did the Illuminati die with Adam Weishaupt. Make sure you understand that. A more modern organization that supports the coming changes is the Masonic Order called simply the Freemasons, or for short, the Masons. It has nothing to do with bricklayers, folks. The term originally comes from the French. Free Masson, which literally means the Sons of Light. This worldwide fraternity has members in America, as will be discussed, and they too support a call for a one-world government. One who has written about this secret organization is Paul Fisher, and he says this about them in his book entitled Behind the Lodge Door, quote, Masonry will eventually rule the world, unquote. <laughs> Benevolent fraternal organization. Albert Pike, and you're going to hear an awful lot about Albert Pike during this series. The sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry here in the United States from 1850 to 1891. The man who founded the Ku Klux Klan and Benai Barith. Wrote a book entitled Morals and Dogma. And when and if you can find that book, don't pass it up, buy it, and read it. Mr. Pike has been praised by his fellow Masons as a member almost without parallel in the history of the Masonic Order. He was a great friend of Giuseppe Massini, the ruler of the European branch of the Illuminati. Carl Cloudy himself, a Masonic writer of great esteem, wrote this about Pike. Quote, Albert Pike, one of the greatest geniuses Freemasonry has ever known. He was a mystic, a symbolist, a teacher of the hidden truths of Freemasonry, unquote. So the outsider can know that whenever Mr. Pike speaks, he speaks with authority and knowledge. He is perhaps the greatest Masonic writer of all time, and I would uh, add next to Manny P. Hall. His book is given to each Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction Freemason who is asked to read it. There seems to be a difference of opinion as to whether or not this book is still required reading for each Scottish Rite Mason. As we were told that it was given to each Scottish Rite Mason in Tucson, other Masons say that that is not true. But you have to remember they're sworn not to reveal the secrets of the Lodge, and therefore you can never trust them to tell you the truth no matter what they're telling you. But in this book, Morals and Dogma, Pike informs the new Mason about the moral teachings of the Masonic Lodge. He instructs the Masonic reader that the order will eventually be asked to rule the entire globe. And he wrote this, quote, The world will soon come to us for its sovereigns and pontiffs. We shall constitute the equilibrium of the universe and be rulers over the masters of the world, unquote. He wrote this supportive statement in a book entitled Legenda, quote, And thus the warfare against the powers of evil that crushed the order of the temple goes steadily on, and freedom marches ever onward toward the conquest of the world, unquote. Reference to the order of the temple is reference to the Knights Templars, who were destroyed in concert by King Philip of France and Pope Clement V, and the powers of evil referred to in this paragraph is the Christian church, the Christian religion, Christianity as a whole. Let me read it to you again, just in case you weren't paying attention. Quote, And thus the warfare against the powers of evil that crushed the order of the temple goes steadily on, and freedom marches ever onward toward the conquest of the world. Unquote. The Order of the Temple Mr. Pike was writing about was the Knights Templar, which was, according to him, quote, devoted to the cause of opposition to the tiara, the Pope's triple crown, and the crown of kings, unquote. Well, then is it any wonder that the King of France and the Pope crushed the Templars in France? For that is the only place that they were truly crushed. 
Mr. Pike said that the Catholic Church was a power of evil because it had crushed the Templars, even though he admitted that they were devoted to opposition to the Church and its leader, the Pope. But the major point of that quote is that these forces of opposition, presumably meaning the Masons, are marching onward toward the conquest of the world. Mr. Pike repeated his devotion to the conquest of the world with this comment at the end of his book entitled Morals and Dogma, quote, Such, my brother, is the true word of a master mason, such the true royal secret which makes possible and shall at length make real the holy empire of true Masonic brotherhood, unquote. And all of you master masons out there who have been writing me letters, don't write to me anymore. You are my enemies. And if I can, I will destroy you. Don't write to me and profess your innocence, for your own have proclaimed your guilt. And if you are truly innocent, then you're just a foolish dupe, and you better get out while you can. The major worldwide movement that champions a one-world government, folks, under a religious leader is a new phenomenon occurring worldwide called the New Age Movement, a creation of Freemasonry. The newspaper put out by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry is called The New Age. Tex Mars, a researcher into this new religion, has written two books on the subject. Both of these books are excellent primers for those who wish to know more about the beliefs of this religion. The two books are entitled Dark Secrets of the New Age and Mystery Mark of the New Age, and he has written, quote, The New Age movement has undeniably taken on the definite form of a religion. Of course, because it is Mystery Babylon, he goes on to say, complete with an agreed-upon body of doctrine, printed scripture, a pattern of worship and ritual, a functioning group of ministers and lay leaders, unquote. Another writer who has written two books on the New Age religion is Constance Tumby. Her two books are called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow and A Planned Deception. She has written this, quote, the New Age movement is a religion, complete with its own Bibles, prayers, and mantras. Vatican City, Jerusalem, equivalents, priests and gurus, born-again experiences, they call it rebirthing, spiritual laws and commandments, psychics and prophets, and nearly every other indicia of a religion, unquote. The New Religion has a series of leaders. One is a woman named Alice Bailey, a prolific writer on the subject of the New Age. She was the founder of an organization called the Arcane School, one of the major Lucis Trust divisions. The Lucis Trust was a major publisher of books supporting the religion and published a newsletter or newspaper called Lucifer. In her book entitled The Externalization of the Hierarchy, she told her readers who the organizations were that were going to bring the New Age religion to the world, and she identified them as being, quote, the three main channels through which the preparation for the New Age is going on might be regarded as the church, the Masonic fraternity, and the educational field. And folks, that is exactly who is bringing it to realization. The main thrust of this program is going to be to examine only one of the three organizations mentioned by Alice Bailey, that being the Masonic Fraternity. There are numerous works by other writers, lecturers, researchers, exposing the involvement of the church in the educational field in the New Age movement and in the New World Order. So I'm not going to attempt to duplicate those efforts. However, only a few are aware of the involvement of the Freemasons, and that is why I have chosen to concentrate on that organization, Mystery Babylon. And the reason I'm concentrating on that organization is because it is their members who have infiltrated the church and the educational field who control those other two organizations. So really there's only one organization that needs to be dealt with, and that is Freemasonry. Another major writer on the New Age movement is Benjamin Cream, and he admitted in his book entitled The Reappearance of the Christ and the Masters of Wisdom that, quote, the new religion will manifest, for instance, through organizations like Masonry. In Freemasonry is embedded the core of the secret of the occult mysteries, unquote. 
So, Masonry conceals a great mystery inside its temples, one that is connected somehow to the New Age movement. The Masons admit in some of their writings that they too are anticipating a new age, a series of major changes. Henry Clausen, the past sovereign grand commander, the equivalent of their president of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, has been quoted as saying this, quote, We look towards a transforming into a new age using, however, the insight and wisdom of the ancient mystics, unquote. The Masons claim that the things that they believe in are as old as the ancient civilizations. They also claim that these mystics, the ancient philosophers, have the wisdom of all ages and that somehow this knowledge has become lost through the centuries. Humanity today does not possess this knowledge, but it has become the test of the Masons and other truth seekers who turn out in every case of investigation to be liars and deceivers and manipulators. To rediscover these principles for the benefit of all mankind, those possessing this knowledge will correct the world's current problems. Some of the Masons also claim to have identified the cause of these problems. One of the most prolific writers on the subject of this lost truth, as I have mentioned earlier, is Manly P. Hall, a 33rd degree Mason. For those unfamiliar with the Masonic degrees, all Masons in America start through what is called the Blue Lodge, consisting of only three degrees. A master mason is of the third degree and really knows nothing, even though he thinks that he has been illumined and I get letters from them all the time. I'm a master mason and I never heard of any of the stuff that you're talking about. <laughs> oh boy. I, it, it amazes me, folks. It just absolutely amazes me that people are so stupid. Drives me wild. The initiate into the Blue Lodge goes through three separate and different initiation ceremonies, one for each degree. After completing these ceremonies, he may stay where he is or choose to affiliate himself with either the York Rite, which has 13 degrees, or the Scottish Rite, which has 32, and then the Meritorious 33rd. The latter is divided into two separate jurisdictions, the Southern and the Northern. And these are based primarily on state borders, and whether one joins one or the other depends on where the initiate lives. The two Scottish rites have an additional 29 degrees, making for a total of 32. There is one more degree called the 33rd degree, which is honorary, and only a few are invited into that degree, and to even be considered, they must perform some major work toward the completion of the great work, which is the plan to bring about. The utopia on earth. The socialist dream. York Rite has a total of nine degrees. However, since little has been revealed about this order, we will concentrate on only the Scottish Rite, and in particular the southern jurisdiction. Well, I've since discovered that the York Rite has a total of 13 degrees, folks, not just nine. Mr. Hall has written a book entitled Lectures on Ancient Philosophy, in which he talks a great deal about the Masonic fraternity. And this is his comment about the coming changes. Quote, A new day is dawning for Freemasonry from the insufficiency of theology and the hopelessness of materialism. Men are turning to seek the God of philosophy. Unquote. Notice that Mr. Hall has said that current theology, obviously current religion, has proven insufficient. Also, he feels that materialism, meaning the right to private property, is also a failure. But more importantly, he points out that this new God of the Freemasons is somehow different from the God of the Jews and Christians, as will be illustrated later. Some of the Masons believe that the God of the Bible is a God of evil. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, perhaps the founder of the current New Age movement, has also determined that the Masons are somehow supportive of her religious views. She wrote this in her book entitled The Secret Doctrine. Quote, At the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries, many Freemasons traveled to Tibet, where they were initiated into the esoteric defined as intended for or understood by only a chosen few as an inner group of disciples or initiates by an esoteric order of the Masters of Wisdom, unquote. It should be expected that she would support the Masonic fraternity. In 1875, she founded an organization called the Theosophical Society, basically dedicated to teaching the world about her new secret religion. One of the earliest members of that organization was Albert Pike, later to become the Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. 
Albert Pike, who later became a 33rd degree Mason, the highest degree attainable, also saw that there were some significant changes coming and that he was supportive of those changes. He wrote the following in his book entitled Morals and Dogma. Quote, We can look on all the evils of the world and see that it is only the hour before sunrise and that the light is coming. Unquote. Now, if Mr. Hall is right, the evils that his fellow Mason Albert Pike saw are connected to current religion, and that which is coming is somehow different from these religious views. Mr. Hall, who is mentioned previously as another 33rd degree Mason, also wrote that a new day was coming and that it was not too far into the future. Quote, a new light is breaking in the East. The significance of the location the East, I have already pointed out, it is the point where the sun rises. A more glorious day is at hand that the rule of the philosophic elect, the dream of the ages, will yet be realized and is not too far distant. Unquote. So, Mr. Hall is also expecting that these changes are about to occur in the not too distant future. Someone who attempted to zero in on when these changes were expected to occur was Alice Bailey, previously mentioned. She wrote about when she thought the new age would arrive. Quote, Eventually, there will appear the church universal, and its definite outlines will appear towards the close of this century, unquote. And you have already seen the emergence of the universalist church. Since she wrote early in the 20th century, we can see that she was predicting the eventual arrival of the New Age sometime around the 1990s. This estimate of that date is not too far wrong, as will be demonstrated later in this series of programs. Whatever is coming in the future, some New Agers have told us that they expect that it will last for a long time. One such writer is Ruth Montgomery, who wrote that she saw that the new religion would rule the earth for a thousand years. She wrote the following in her book entitled Herald for the New Age. Quote, the New Age, the Millennium, a millennium is a period of one thousand years, will see an end to that strife at least for a thousand years. Unquote. Now, just what the New Age religion that will last for at least one thousand years on earth, what is it? One who attempted to answer that question was Constance Cumby in her book entitled The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. She wrote that these were the basic tenets of the new religion. Listen closely. The plan for the future includes the installation of a new world messiah, the implementation of a new world government and new world religion under Maitreya, an individual who will be examined later in this series of programs. Two, a universal credit card system will be implemented as a cashless society. Three, a World Food Authority will control all of the world's food supply. Four, a universal tax. Five, a universal draft. And six, they intend on utterly rooting out people who believe the Bible and worship God and to completely stamp out Christianity from the face of this earth. As was discussed prior to this summary, certain people have indicated that they see the Catholic Church as an enemy. Here, Mrs. Cumby says that they see not only Catholicism as the enemy, they also see all of Christianity as an enemy. Whatever the New Agers believe in, folks, it appears to be growing in popularity. Bantam Books, one of this nation's leading publishing houses, has reported that the sales of their New Age titles has increased tenfold in the past decade. Time Magazine reports that the number of New Age bookstores has doubled in the past five years to a total of about 2,500. According to an article in Forbes magazine, quote, publishers estimate that total sales of New Age titles today are at least $100 million at retail, unquote. So, whatever they believe in, many believe in it. But perhaps the most insightful comment about the nature of what the New Age religion believe in and who they worship as their god was written by Mrs. Cumby in her book entitled The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. She wrote that they had... Quote, the intent of bringing about a new world order, an order that writes God out of the picture and deifies Lucifer, unquote. So if Mrs. Cumby and the other writers on the subject are right, the New Age movement needs to be studied in some depth. We know that the goal of Freemasonry, at least that which is stated, is to bring about the new man, the illumined man, and the number of the man is 666. 
Please, we're doing all we can for you. We're trying to bring you back down to normal size. You do think I'm a freak, don't you? But you know, to me, you're the freak. The one who's different. I'm not growing. You're shrinking. <laughs> he started as a normal human being. But now each day he doubles in size. Where will it stop? The amazing colossal man. Colonel, he's been reported in Las Vegas. Impossible. How can he walk 120 miles in only an hour? Impossible. Not when you're 60 feet tall. The amazing colossal man. Now, don't forget, folks, Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m. to 11, Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego. I'll be giving a lecture, The Sacrifice King, admissions $40. For tagging members, it's $30. Once again, Monday, March 25th, 8 p.m., Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard. Now, you want to know what we need to do, folks? I want you to listen to this closing song. Good night, and God bless you all. I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to The Hour of the Time. Don't forget, folks, Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m., the Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard, San Diego. I'll be giving a presentation called The Sacrifice King. I will show you, absolutely, with no doubt whatsoever, who killed John F. Kennedy. I'll tell you right now, but you're going to have to come and see this presentation before you'll believe it. it was, he was actually assassinated by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. You will be amazed to see what Dealey Plaza really is. It's not just an innocent little park in Dallas at all. The occult symbology connected to the Kennedy assassination cannot be refuted by anyone. Don't miss it. Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m., the Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego. I will be there. The price of admission is $40. For CAGI members, it's $30. Bring your friends, bring your relatives. Once and for all, you will have the answer that you need, and you can begin to do something about this. All of you. Because I'm going to be giving you some things that we can do to stop this in its tracks during this series. Also, we need money, folks. We need donations to stay on the air. If you want this show to stay on the air, make a check or money order out to WWCR, not to me. I don't want your money. It goes right directly to the radio station. Make checks or money orders out to WWCR, not to me. Send them to Stan, Post Office Box 889. Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Stan, Post Office Box 889. Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Or you can call Stan and talk to him, ask him to send you a packet of information. His number is 602 567 6109. That's 602 567 Six one zero nine. Now, if you'd like to join CAGI, that's the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, send forty-five dollars, along with your name and address. Tell us you want to join CAGI, and we'll put you on the rolls. Now, if you live in another country outside the United States, the membership fee is fifty-five dollars, and yes, you too can join. We're interested in saving the Constitution, the United States of America, and freedom for the world, so you're not left out no matter where you live. Okay? If you're interested in purchasing my book, Behold a Pale Horse, which has many of the answers in it that you're all looking for, if you're a CAGI member, it's $25. That includes postage and handling. If you're not a CAGI member, it's $30, and that includes postage and handling. This is the same address to Stan, Post Office Box 889. Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Now, at the Lafayette Hotel that weekend, the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th, uh, we'll be there. We'll have a table. My books will be there. Also tapes of the Kennedy assassination will be there. Also tapes of my Atlanta lecture, which is uh, over seven hours in length. Uh, they will be there. If you like to get a copy of those, also my book, 
behold a pale horse. So I hope to be able to see you there. I want to see CADGI members for sure. And anybody that's a listener to this program, I'd love to meet you, shake your hand, talk. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be making myself available to spend with, with you people when you come. Now, this is a conference. It's called the National New Age and Truth About UFOs Conference. I have nothing to do with the New Age movement, folks. And I am not a ufologist. I have nothing to do with that. But I have been invited to give a presentation on Monday night at 8 p.m., and I'm going to be there and do that. You see, I'll go anywhere and talk to anybody. I love people. My mission is to deliver a message to everyone. One of the reasons that the New Age movement has made such inroads is that most of you out there have abdicated. You've given it up to them. You see, anybody can get a table at any of these conferences, if you want to call them that, or shows, or whatever you want to call them, meetings, expositions. Anybody can buy a table. All you have to do is write to the organizers, say you want to buy a table, pay your money, and you've got a table. <laughs> It's simple. I know that these people are just as misled as everybody else. So, I want to talk to them, too. I'll talk to anybody. You want me to come to your town? Call Stan. Ask him how to do it. You can get me to your town, too, to speak. Folks, something is wrong in America. No doubt about it. There's a new religion appearing, many of it called, many of you call it the New Age religion, and it appears to be the exact opposite of the Old Age religion, meaning the religion of the Jews and the Christians. It's not really that different. I've studied it. I've talked to people who practice it. They claim it's not a religion, but it is. Christ has ceased to become a man, the Son of God, the actual manifestation of God in the flesh on earth, and has become the consciousness, the Christ consciousness. And anyone can be Christ if they have this Christ consciousness in the New Age religion. Now, these are the two religions, the Christian religion and the Jewish religion, that set the United States on its course, because these religions taught that mankind had some basic human rights. They held that the family was the basic unit in all of the world. They believed in the right to private property. They believed in the unalienable, which is defined as being incapable of being surrendered, right to life. They held that each person had the right to worship their God, and they held that all had the right to freedom of association, as shall be so disclosed during this series. These positions were deemed to be self-evident by those who wrote the American Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and became the cornerstones of the American civilization. The term self-evident, folks, means that these human rights were not worthy of debate because they stood on their own simply because they were true. They could not be debated because they were creator-endowed, endowed by God. Yet, folks, today these cornerstones of American life are no longer self-evident to many. They are being publicly discussed. People and organizations are now debating whether an individual has the basic human right to life, liberty, and property. There's a great danger in this. Frederick Wilhelm Nietzsche, a German philosopher and one of the teachers of many of the world's leading communist revolutionaries and international socialists, put the argument quite succinctly in this statement, quote, I condemn Christianity. I raise against the Christian church the most terrible of all accusations that any accuser uttered. It is to me the highest conceivable corruption, unquote. Remember, the priests, the initiates of the mystery schools, believe that Christianity is a corruption of the mysteries, the worship of Lucifer, represented by the sun, the light, Osiris. Tex Mars, an author who has written in opposition to the New Age, wrote this about their hatred of the Christians. Quote, The New Age believer is told, You could be a god in the next instant if only those horrible Christians weren't around with their poisonous attitudes. Unquote. That thought was illustrated by another of the important New Agers, David Spangler, 
who wrote this in his book entitled Reflections on the Christ. Quote, we can take all the scriptures and all the teachings and all the tablets and all the laws and all the marshmallows and have a jolly good bonfire and marshmallow roast because that is all they are worth, unquote. So the New Age, like the Masons, feel that Christianity is the enemy, a force to be countered, not by open debate, but by contempt and ridicule, and as shall be illustrated later, by even murder. And remember, the source of the New Age movement is the order of the Freemasons. Other parties wish to join the debate. In 1911, the Socialist Party of Great Britain published a pamphlet entitled Socialism and Religion, in which they placed their position about religion into the arena. Quote, It is therefore a profound truth that socialism is the natural enemy of religion. A Christian socialist is in fact an anti-socialist. Christianity is the antithesis of socialism, unquote. So the socialists, the New Ager, and the Mason have declared war on the Christians. And, as in every war, the enemy must be defeated even by bloodshed if necessary. This war has deep roots in history, and I will cover those roots so that you will understand it perfectly where this came from. This war is no different Bloodshed is anticipated by all parties in the battle. LaBetty Lafferty and Bud Hollowell, two New Agers, started the discussion about how their religion sanctions the use of violence against the Christian community. They wrote the following in their book entitled The Eternal Dance. Quote, This is a time of opportunity for those who will take it, apparently meaning the New Agers, the initiates of the mystery religions, socialists, for others, apparently the Christians, if the earth is unsuitable for them, if they will not accept the New Age religion, they will go on to other worlds, unquote, which simply means they will be exterminated. You better listen to me, folks. I am a messenger, and my message is unmistakable, and it had better not fall upon deaf ears, for those deaf ears will be rendered dead in the coming New World Order. Another New Age spokesman, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the guru sought out by the rock and roll group known as the Beatles and others, has been quoted as saying, quote, There has not been and there will not be a place for the unfit. The fit will leave, and if the unfit are not coming along, if they will not accept the New Age religion, there is no place for them. In the Age of Enlightenment, there is no place for ignorant people. Non-existence of the unfit has been the law of nature, unquote. Another example of New Age thinking on this vital issue came from a pamphlet available in a bookstore selling New Age material. It was published by something called The Guardian Action Publications of New Mexico, and it was entitled Cosmic Countdown. This pamphlet alleged that it had received these thoughts from something called Higher Intelligence, and it directed its attention to the hunger disease problem in the third world, and the pamphlet simply stated, Quote, the world should be forewarned to be on the lookout for diseases which have been suppressed for years, suddenly rearing their ugly heads and decimating populations already on the verge of starvation in the third world nations. Although these peoples will eventually be replaced by the new root race about to make its appearance in a newly cleansed world, nevertheless, for the moment, this is a tragedy, unquote. You see, they have made incredible admissions, but none of you are looking, none of you are reading, none of you are absorbing. In fact, most of you are so stupid that you think that the only thing you should read is what you personally believe in or agree with. How can you exist in this world ignorant of the opinions and the writings and the thoughts of everyone else, including your enemy? The words reveal an incredible scenario. You see, these people in the third world nations are going to be entirely replaced by what they call, quote, a new root race, unquote. That eventuality will not be a tragedy. The tragedy is that these people are dying now due to starvation and disease, but when they die later or they're all gone and they're replaced by the new root race, that won't be a tragedy. 
The concept that a new race of people will inhabit the world in the New Age millennium has been expressed by other believers in the religion. Ruth Montgomery, previously mentioned, has written about that change. Quote, those who survive the shift will be a different type of people from those in physical form today, freed from strife and hatred, longing to be of service to the whole of mankind. The souls who helped to bring on the chaos of the present century, apparently the Christians and the Jews, will have passed into spirit to retake their attitudes, unquote. To show that the New Agers are talking about the physical death of the enemy, one must only search the writings of other New Agers. Another believer to write on the subject of the destruction of those who will not accept the new religion was Ruth Mont Montgomery. And she has been quoted as saying in a transcribed interview carried by a magazine called Magical Blend, quote, Millions will survive and millions won't. Those who won't will go into the spirit state because there is truly no death, unquote. Estimates of the number to perish have been made by some New Agers. One who has made such an estimate is John Randolph Price, who was quoted by Tex Mars in his book about the New Age, and he said that, quote, John Randolph Price was told by his spirit guide that up to two and one half billion might perish in the coming chaos, unquote. And we already know that the goal of the plan called Global 2000 is to deplete the population by 2 billion people by the year 2000. Now, that estimate is about half of the current world population, 2 and 1 half billion. Another estimate of the number required to die because they will not accept the new religion was offered by the so-called Tibetan master, Dwal Kul, who has said in one of his channeling experiences that one-third of all humanity must die by the year 2000. That would be about 2 billion people, at least. Channeling is one of the strange activities occurring inside the New Age religion. I have witnessed this, witnessed this and I can tell you most channelers are just fraudulent, fraudulent con artists who are taking the money of those who pay to hear this channeling from dead spirits or ancient teachers or other world spirits. Some of the believers claim that they have the ability to call forth the deceased spirit of someone who lived many years before. Quite often, these spirits claim to be the ascended masters, those who have gone on to discover the eternal truths of all creation. One such believer who claimed to be in touch with a master was Alice Bailey, previously mentioned. Her spirit called himself Yuval Cool, and she claimed he spoke through her saying, quote, Death is not a disaster to be feared. The work of the destroyer is not really cruel or undesirable. Therefore, there is much destruction permitted by the custodians of the plan, and much evil turned into good, unquote. Now, just what the plan constituted was told to the world by Benjamin Krim, another New Age leader. He placed an advertisement in about 20 newspapers all over the world on April the 25th, April the 25th, 1982, that defined the term. The ad read in part, quote, What is the plan? It includes the installation of a new world government and new world religion under Maitreya, unquote. But perhaps the most startling example of the teachings of this new religion came from the pen of Barbara Marks Hubbard, one of their most articulate writers, and she wrote in her book entitled Happy Birthday, Planet Earth, quote, The choice is, do you wish to become a natural Christ, a universal human, or do you wish to die? People will either change or die. That is the choice, unquote. So the people of the world will be given a choice. They will choose to accept the new religion, or they will choose to die. The battle lines are drawn. Choices will have to be made. I have made my choice. What is yours? Some of the leading socialists of the past have shown that they, too, have chosen up sides. One such individual was Adolf Hitler, the head of the German government during World War II, who held no conviction that the murder of over 50 million people during that war was wrong. He considered himself to be an agent of this unseen God in reducing the population of people that he held to be undesirable. He wrote, quote, I have the right to exterminate millions of individuals of inferior races which multiply like vermin, unquote. And he did what he considered acceptable inside his religion. 
Those who did not believe in his new religion had no choice, and they perished. The evidence that Adolf Hitler was a New Ager will be presented later in this series. Another of the leading spokesmen for the socialist position was George Bernard Shaw, a well-known writer during his day. He wrote a book entitled The Intelligent Woman's Guide to Socialism, in which he stated, quote, I also made it quite clear that socialism means equality of income or nothing, and under socialism you would not be allowed to be poor. <laughs> you would be forcibly fed, clothed, lodged, taught, and employed, whether you like it or not, whether you're useful or not, even if it were discovered that you had not the character and industry enough to be worth all this trouble. You might be executed in a kindly manner, but whilst you were permitted to live, you would have to live well, unquote. Socialism is the greatest perversion, deception, and lie that has ever existed on the face of this earth and has brought nothing but misery, death, poverty to people who have been subjected to its cruelties. The Masonic writer Albert Pike placed the Masonic order into the discussion when he wrote this in his book, Morals and Dogma. Quote, It is not true to say that one man, however little, must not be sacrificed to another, however great, to a majority or to all men. That is not only a fallacy, but a most dangerous one. Often one man and many men must be sacrificed to the ordinary sense of the term to the interests of the many. The interest and even the life of one man must often be sacrificed to the interest and welfare of his country. Unquote. The religious view is that the sacrifice of one life for the interest of the many is murder. And those who believe in the God of the Bible are told not to commit this act. The commandment against this practice is contained in Exodus 20, verse 13 of the Old Testament, and in Matthew 5, verse 21 in the New. And it's simply expressed in these simple words, quote, Thou shalt not kill, unquote. The principle is easy to understand. No person has the right to take the life of another. This understanding is nearly worldwide. There are, of course, of course cultures that have determined that human sacrifice, cannibalism, and murder are acceptable forms of behavior, but these are rare in the history of man. But here we are being exposed to a whole new religious view, one growing daily in size and stature that openly advocates the wholesale slaughter of entire races of people. Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Bavarian branch of the Illuminati, has also endorsed this new conviction that murder was not improper by including it in the initiation ceremony into the order. He has his initiator tell the initiate, quote, Behold our secret. If in order to destroy all Christianity, all religion, we have pretended to have the sole true religion, remember that the end justifies the means, and that the wise ought to take all the means to do good which the wicked take to do evil. Unquote. The initiate was told that he may use whatever means murder included to achieve the goals of the association that he was joining, and that the major goal of the Illuminati was the destruction of all religion, including Christianity. That meant that if Christians physically stood in the way, they would be removed by simply murdering them. Weishaupt even went so far as to say that anyone, anyone not willing to take the life of another was unfit to join the Illuminati. He wrote the following in a letter to a fellow member in 1778. Quote, No man is fit for our order who is not ready to go to every length. Unquote. Weishaupt wrote that again, this time using different words. Quote, This can be done in no other way but by secret associations, which will, by degrees and in silence, possess themselves of the government of the state and make use of those means for this purpose, which the wicked use for attaining base ends. Unquote. And Weishaupt, folks, was aware of the enormous power of government, and he desired its power for his members. He committed his organization to its infiltration. Then he committed it to unspeakable purposes, anything that would further the goal of the Illuminati. He even went on to grant permission to his members to distort the truth by lying if it would further their goals. He wrote this, quote, 
There must not a single purpose ever come in sight that may betray our aims against religion and the state. One must speak sometimes one way and sometimes another, but so as never to contradict ourselves, and so that with respect to our true way of thinking, we may be impenetrable." Unquote. And you wonder why politicians continually lie, and continually break their promises, and no matter who you elect, Republican or Democrat, it doesn't make any difference. Perhaps a perfect example of an oath that these initiates take somewhere along the road to the pinnacle inside the secret society was given in a book written by George Orwell, entitled 1984. Mr. Orwell has an initiate into a secret society called The Brotherhood in his story ask these questions. Quote, Are you prepared to give your life? Are you prepared to commit murder? Are you prepared to commit acts of sabotage which may cause the death of hundreds of innocent people? Are you prepared to betray your country to foreign powers? Are you prepared to cheat, to forge, to blackmail, to corrupt the minds of children, to distribute habit-forming drugs, to encourage prostitution, to disseminate venereal diseases, to do anything which is likely to cause demoralization and weaken the power of the people? Are you prepared to commit suicide if and when we order you to do so? This folks, is an example of the philosophy that the ends justify the means. The initiate should do as he was required as long as the act benefited the brotherhood. There is no morality under such an oath. So murder of the unfit, those unwilling to adopt the new religion, will be acceptable, and those who do the annihilating are to feel no remorse. In the view of the New Age religion, the murderers have served mankind well. But this callous disregard for the right to life of every human on the face of the earth has been predicted before in the New Testament. John was moved to write in John chapter 6, verse 12, quote, Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service, unquote. The new world order, ladies and gentlemen, will sail in on a sea of blood. We have to take a short break now, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this short pause. Um, can you hear me in the booth? Loud and clear, Lisa. Oh, good. Thank you, sir, for letting me be in a real studio. It's a genuine thrill, sir. Could I trouble you with one request? Sure thing. No synthetic sound, please. I want all live musicians.
Don't forget, folks, Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m. to 11, Lafayette Hotel, 2223, El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego. That's Monday, March 15th. I'll be there from 8 to 11, the Lafayette Hotel, 2223, El Cajon Boulevard, San Diego. I'm going to present a lecture with uh, quite a bit of videotape entitled The Sacrificed King, and proved to you once and for all beyond any shadow of a doubt that John F. Kennedy was not killed by our government, but by the mystery schools, specifically the branch known as the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. You will see the missing frames, the footage of the Zapruder film that the public has never been allowed to see before. You'll see it with your own eyes. You're going to see and hear things that are going to stretch the bounds of credibility, stretch your imagination, but it will all become clear to you. You will have no doubts when you walk out at the end exactly who killed Kennedy and why. Well, let's continue here. The New Age religion, folks, is going to have a worldwide leader, a charismatic political and religious leader that they call Lord Maitreya. At least so far, that's who they call him, or that's what they call him. This individual, as far as I know, has not made his public appearance yet, but the New Agers claim that he is on the earth at the present time. They claim that he came to live with the Asian community in East London, England, in July 1977, by descending from his ancient retreat in the Himalaya Mountains along the border of India and Tibet. They further believe that his imminent emergence into full public view is assured. They also claim that this individual is the one that the Christians call Christ, the Jews call the Messiah, the Buddhists call the Fifth Buddha, the Hindus call Krishna, and the Muslims call the Imam Mahdi. In other words, all of the major religions of the world are awaiting the arrival of this one individual. It is their claim that this one individual living now in London is the one expected by all of these religions. However, when we search London with a fine-tooth comb, we can find no trace of any living individual named Maitreya or fitting this description, or recognized as this religious leader. Isn't that strange? And they say that he is on the earth now, patiently waiting for the appointed time to reveal his existence to the peoples of the world. They say that he will apparently assume the leadership of all of these religions, and when he does, he will create a one-world religion. The New Agers have written that in the esoteric tradition previously defined as being intended for or understood by only a cho chosen few as an inner group of disciples or initiates, in other words, the esoteric means hidden. They claim that the word Christ is not the name of an individual, but the name of an office or function within the spiritual hierarchy of masters. They claim that the masters are a group of perfected men who have guided human evolution from behind the scenes for centuries, and they believe that this Lord Maitreya is that Christ. Now, Manly P. Hall has written of this individual by identifying him as, quote, the way, the truth, and the life, which coming to every life redeems all who accept it, unquote. 
Tex Mars has quoted this individual as saying, quote, My army is ready for battle, my masters of wisdom and myself at the head. That battle will be fought for the continuance of man on this earth. Rest assured that my army shall triumph, unquote. Well, it appears that the battle to be fought between the followers of Lord Maitreya and the rest of humanity is still in the future. But at least one of the participants has an army already prepared. How about you? One who claims to have seen the birth in a vision of someone who seems to fulfill the requirements of this Maitreya was astrologer Jean Dixon. Her major claim to being a prophet is her prediction, reportedly made before the event of the assassination of President John Kennedy in 1963. However, her credentials were dealt a serious blow in 1968 when she also prophesied that the Soviet Union would be the first to put a man on the moon. <laughs> Another of her prophecies was that the Republican Party would be victorious in 1968. And it was with the election of Richard Nixon, a Republican. But she also predicted that within the following decade, 1970 to 1979, the two-party system, as we have known it, will vanish from the American scene. She further predicted that Richard and Nixon had excellent vibrations for the good of America and would serve the country well. <laughs> so you can see that she's a very accurate person from which to judge the course of the future. If you want to know the truth, folks, I am the most accurate prophet of future events in history. In history. Those who question her inability to correctly predict that America, not the Soviet Union, would become the first to place a man on the moon, and that the two-party system has not vanished from the scene, and that President Nixon apparently did not have good vibrations for this nation, and would later be removed from office by the event commonly referred to as Watergate, can only presume that she must have been given inside information about the assassination of President Kennedy. And that would account for her knowing at least in that event the true future. Secondly, one can only wonder why this non-prophet should be listened to about anything after her appalling record on prophecies, but there is reason to believe that she might have been asked to write an account of this vision of the important birth by the New Age religion, because they wanted the official imprimatur of someone commonly referred to as a prophet. In other words, folks, her prophecy might have been written to legitimize his claim to be a man-god, so that when this individual made his public appearance himself, the public would marvel at the fact that his birth had fulfilled a prophecy. <laughs> but in any event, Ruth Montgomery wrote a book about her entitled The Gift of Prophecy, in which she wrote about the very revealing and intriguing vision that Jean Dixon allegedly had. Quote, the vision, which Jean considers the most significant and soul-stirring of her life, occurred on February the 5th, 1962. She saw the brightest sun she had ever seen. Isn't it funny how that sun always pops into this stuff? Now remember that reference to the sun, folks. Stepping out of the brightness were a pharaoh and Queen Nefertiti. Remember here that these two individuals were Egyptians. And this will become significant later on. In fact, it's already significant if you've been listening to this show. The couple thrust forth a baby as if offering it to the entire world. Now, another interpretation, because they sprang from the sun, could be that this is Osiris and Isis, and the child is Horus. And that is exactly the esoteric, real interpretation. Although, Jeannie Dixon never said this. He looked at the baby and then said, according to the author, quote, I knew here is the beginning of wisdom, unquote. Remember what I told you? Osiris is the doctrine, Isis is the church. The child Horus is the body of illumined initiates. So what Ruth Montgomery wrote can be summarized as follows. A sun deity gives the world a child from Egypt who possesses enormous wisdom. And this event allegedly took place on February the 5th, 1962. The interpretation of these symbols 
have already been discussed and will continue to be discussed during this series, and the significance will be plain to all. Gene then says, quote, A child, born somewhere in the Middle East, shortly after 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on February the 5th, 1962, will revolutionize the world. Before the close of the century, he will bring together all mankind in one all-embracing faith. Mankind will begin to feel the great force of this man in the early 1980s, and during the subsequent ten years, the world as we know it will be reshaped into one without wars and suffering. His power will grow greatly until 1999, and this year is extremely significant, as will also be discussed, at which time the peoples of this earth will probably discover the full meaning of the vision." Unquote. So according to this vision, a child born on February the 5th, 1962, will grow up to bring a one-world religion onto the face of the earth, and his efforts will be successful in 1999. The New York Times newspaper folks ran three consecutive articles on the conjunction of five planets, the sun, the moon, and an invisible body that astrologers call Ketu, starting on February the 4th, 1962. The first article stated that the various bodies moved into rough alignment in the constellation Capricorn at 7.05 a.m. New York Times. A Capricorn remembers the goat. In history, the goat was the goat of Mindy's, or the ram. And the newspaper article also says that they would remain in that alignment until 7.17 a.m. New York Time Monday. The goat of Mindy's, the ram, is also another word or another name for Lucifer, Satan. However, the article went on to say that most of the people in India became alarmed because most astrologers were making predictions of disasters. There were a few astrologers who were predicting good for the world as a result of this alignment, but few Indians appeared to be paying them much heed. Now couple that with Gene Dixon's prediction that the child was born on February the 5th, 1962, midpoint in this alignment, and what do you get? <laughs> They're going to great pains to prepare the world for something. Astronomers did not consider the event to be rare, however, and the article went on to report that the same configuration had occurred several times in the past. The last time being in April 1821, and then it occurred twice. The article reported that Dr. Kenneth L. Franklin of the Museum of Natural History, Hayden Planetarium in New York, had commented that, that that year does not seem to be a year of any remembered disasters. He was then quoted as saying, and that year isn't famous for anything, as far as I know. <laughs> Dr. Franklin also commented on the body the astrologers call Ketu. He speculated that it may be some sort of astrological addition used to make everything come out right. He then added that he believed Ketu to be the invisible planet that is frequently taken into account in astrological reckonings, but that he had no idea how it was possible to keep track of something that no one could see, and as far as he knew, didn't even exist. The Times carried another article the next day, Monday, February the 5th, 1962, the date that the supposed child was born, and it repeated the concern of the Hindu astrologers. In fact, that headline read, Hindu astrologers still say it's doomsday. And the subheadline read, Peaceful beginning of planetary event is viewed gravely. Now, the third article in the series ran on Tuesday, February 6th, 1962, and carried the headline, quote, Doomsday in India, uneventful, unquote. <laughs> the article reported that the Indian astrologers had predicted a variety of disasters, earthquakes, tidal waves, devastating fires, and warfare, to name but a few, but that none of these events had occurred. Furthermore, the article reported that Hindu priests had claimed that the reason nothing had happened was because their prayers to their God had been answered. But folks, none of these three articles mentioned the birth of anyone in these three days. Furthermore, none but a few astrologers had believed that something good was going to happen, and that only a few in India had even listened to them. Only Jean Dixon, another astrologer, had seen a vision of something beneficial, in this case the birth of a baby full of wisdom at about the midpoint of the three-day affair. 
One can only wonder if once again she missed the mark and was involved in another error, or if she was intentionally made to set up the world to welcome someone named Lord Maitreya. In any event, these people claim that the Lord Maitreya will appear shortly to the entire world and start everyone off on a road to a one-world religion. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, in her book entitled The Secret Doctrine, called him, quote, the Dragon of Wisdom, unquote. So it appears that the one call that Jean Dixon made that appears to match other comments is her statement that the baby she saw in her vision was full of wisdom. If the baby she claimed to have seen in her vision was Lord Maitreya, then she was right because others have claimed that Lord Maitreya is full of wisdom. However, there is still reason to believe that she was given inside information by some New Agers who wanted to have this Lord's birth prophesied so that when he did surface, the New Agers could claim that his birth had been a fulfilled prophecy. So the world awaits the visible appearance of Lord Maitreya. Ladies and gentlemen, dear listeners, so that you would realize that I'm not making any of this up, I took last night's program and tonight's program verbatim from the introduction all the way through chapter 3 of a book entitled The New World Order by my good friend A. Ralph Epperson. Again, the title of the book is The New World Order by A. Ralph Epperson, and you can order that book in any good bookstore. If you can't find it in your area, Contact us, and we will make arrangements with Mr. Epperson to be able to furnish that book to you if you would like to purchase it. I also recommend that you purchase my book, Behold a Pale Horse. It's a handbook for what's going to happen in the coming years, especially in this country. And without it, you will be crippled. If you would like to purchase my book, Behold a Pale Horse, if you're a CAGI member, send $25. That includes postage and handling. If you're not a CAGI member, send $30. That includes postage and handling. Also ask for a packet of information on how to join CAGI and all of the other things that we have available for you. Send it to Stan at Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86 Three two two, or you can call Stan at six zero two five six seven six one zero nine. That's six zero two five six seven six one zero nine. While you're at it, folks, reach way down deep into your pockets, make a check or money order out to WWCR to help us pay for this airtime. If you like this show, if you want it to continue, then please take out a check to WWCR and send it along with your request for information to Stan. Folks, we are nearing the end of the road of civilization as we know it, unless we wake up, unless we take control and make sure the future is what we want it to be. And one of the things that we must do now immediately is stop fighting amongst each other. Stop Fighting the man who doesn't look like you, or the woman who doesn't look like you, the people who have a different skin color than you do. We must learn to live together, and it's nobody else's business what somebody else's religion is. It doesn't hurt us if they want to practice their religion as long as they are not hurting us in the process. So why go to war with them? We are all brothers and sisters in this world, no matter who we are. Let's learn to live together and love each other. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you. Good evening, folks, and once again, welcome to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Don't forget, folks, don't forget, March 15th, 8 p.m., Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard, San Diego. I'll be there talking for about three hours showing you some videotapes that you've never seen before that will literally blow your mind. 
That's Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m., the Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard, San Diego. Now, if you'd like to call and find out about this uh, conference, call area code 619-492-8588. That's 619-492-8588. It's $40 admission. If you're a CAGI member, it's $30. CAGI members, please buy your ticket at the conference not at any of the places that are advertised where you can buy advanced tickets. They cannot accommodate you. Caddy members, buy your tickets at the conference, please. Now, we still need money to help pay for airtime, folks. If you like this show, if you're learning something, if you want this show to stay on the air, make a check or money order out to WWCR. Do it now. Don't wait, because you know what happens when we put things off. Do it now. WWCR and send it to us. Also, ask for a packet of information in the process, and we'll be happy to send you a whole packet full of stuff. Send it to Stan, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Stan, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Or you can call Stan and talk to him on the phone. He's a heck of a nice guy. In fact, you can't get any better than Stan. At 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Now, folks, the Dallas Morning News on October 1st, 1989, published this story. Anglican leader calls for unity under Pope. The byline is Associated Press. Rome, Anglican leader, Archbishop Robert Runcie called Saturday for all Christians to accept the Roman Catholic Pope as a common leader presiding in love. For the Universal Church, I renew the plea, he said, could not all Christians come to reconsider the kind of primacy the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, exercised within the early church? Again, folks, that was in the Dallas Morning News, October 1st, 1989. This story appeared in the Bakersfield, Californian, August 27th, 1989. Baptist and Catholic theologians find common ground. Associated Press, New York. Southern Baptists and Roman Catholics, the nation's two largest denominations, generally have been regarded as doctrinally far apart, but their scholars find they basically agree. The 163-page report is seen as the most full-scale mutual examination of respective positions of the two traditions. Achieving it was an unprecedented experience for Southern Baptists, commonly averse to ecumenical affairs. The talks, sponsored by the Catholic Bishops' Committee on Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs and the Southern Baptist Department of Interfaith Witness, involved 18 meetings between 1978 and 1988. Again, that appeared in the Bakersfield, California, on August 27, 1989. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully during this broadcast, for the message tonight is extremely important. And understand that I am not attacking Catholics or anyone else. I am merely giving you the results of our research, and sometimes the results of this research is disturbing. It shows how we've been misled and deceived over hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. You see, folks, more wars have been fought and more blood has been shed in the name of religion than any other cause, perhaps all other causes. Countless millions have been slaughtered in the name of God, Allah, Buddha, Muhammad, Christ, for thousands of years. Christian killing Jew, Jew hating Muslim, the Muslim against the Hindu, Christian fighting Christian, Shiite versus Sunni, Sikh against Hindu. Endless rivers of blood supposedly shed to rid the world of evil men and make way for peace. And of course, it never happens. And that's what they say about this new world order that it's going to rid the world of evil men and make way for a thousand years of peace. Well, is it possible for people of varied faiths and cultures to live at peace in this world? When one considers the fragmentation and division even among Christians or the never-ending conflict between Palestinian and Jew, prospects for peace seem very, very dim. 
Some, aware of the dark record of history, would abolish all religion. Some would combine all religion, as is the intent in the New World Order, and anyone who refused will simply be exterminated. Today, something unmatched in history is taking place. Leading statesmen and religious leaders are proposing a new world order, a plan that many sincerely believe can bring peace on earth. A unity is envisioned that will transcend instinctive barriers that have long separated cultures and religions. Significant progress toward a new world order is seen in the spirit of ecumenism, or togetherness, now being urged by prominent religious leaders and being brought to reality to fruition by the World Council of Churches. In the ecumenical plan, basic theological or ideological differences are set aside, while emphasis is instead placed upon those elements common to most religions. And I can tell you that the New World religion will be a religion that serves man, because man is to become God in the New World Order. And the religion will change with the needs of man. Could the long desired universal peace be just around the corner? Could this succeed? Is it actually possible for men to forge a lasting peace on the anvil of compromise? Or could it be that we are naively forging not a new world order, but rather the one world order of apocalyptic prophecy? Or is it all an invention of the mind of man throughout the ages to manipulate large masses and populations of people? I make no judgment, and I do not try to answer all of these questions. You must do that in your own mind. But I must ask those questions, for many of you have never even thought to ask them. While controversial, folks, it is not the purpose of this program, The Hour of the Time, to disparage or attack the honest convictions of any sincere persons, whatever their politic or faith, for I am a true constitutionalist, and I believe that we each have the right to believe whatever we wish, no matter who likes it or dislikes it, and worship at the altar of whichever God we choose, no matter who likes it or who dislikes it. It happens to be one of the precepts of living in freedom. You must understand that. No one's right to believe what they want or practice the religion what, that they want can be hindered until the practice of that religion or the activation of those beliefs infringe upon the freedom of someone else. Now, I sincerely in my heart and in my soul, believe this. Without this belief, man cannot live in freedom and must be subjected to slavery, and any intelligent, free-thinking person can quickly make that connection. That is why, even if you do not like the ravings of the Nazi speaker standing on the street corner, he must be allowed to stand and rave. And if you wish to listen, that is your business. If you wish to close your ears and walk away, that also is your business. But when you shut him up, you shut yourself up, no matter who you are or what it is that you say. For what we do to one, we do to all. Therefore, understand, this is a program bringing you information, and we hope education, and it is not designed to attack any one, but merely to shine some light in the dark corners of history where light has not been found before. You see, our purpose is to bring out facts and principles which have a bearing upon coming events. For those of you who may not realize it, this is not a religious show. This is not a religious show. This is a show that is designed to educate, illuminate, if you will, and that's very ironic because we are illuminating those who call themselves Illumin, who have been causing us misery for thousands of years. We're trying to reveal the hidden agenda behind the New World Order. 
and along with it the ecumenical movement that almost no one dares to discuss, which is a part of the bringing about of the New World Order. But you see, folks, these issues must be freely discussed, no matter who you are or what you believe. For those who know history know that history repeats, and those who ignore the lessons of history are doomed to repeat the history. As Winston Churchill once observed, folks, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you can see. And that is really the secret why my predictions have been so accurate, so accurate that at this moment I am the most successful and accurate prophet on the face of this earth. But I'm not really a prophet, I'm a messenger. And they're not prophecy that I give you, they're predictions based upon actual study research of history and of the plan of those who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages, the practicers of that religion called Mystery Babylon. And it is real, and it doesn't matter if you believe in any of this or not. If the practitioners believe it, it will affect you, especially if they hold powerful positions in the world. And I can assure you that they do. So this is not a religious program, folks. It just happens to be true that the New World Order is founded upon the religious history of the past. And it is all about religion as you will soon see. When Jesus revealed to his disciples the fate of Jerusalem and the scenes of the second advent, he foretold also the experience of his people from the time when he would be taken from them until his return in power and glory for their deliverance. This is what the Bible says. In a few brief utterances of awful significance, Jesus foretold the portion which the rulers of this world would mete out to the church of God in Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, verse 21, and verse 22. Now, the reason I am quoting this is because if what is happening is being brought about by religious history, then we must understand the religious history and the books and the chapters and the verses that this religious history is based upon. For whatever belief is driving the minds of the men that are bringing about the New World Order, and the minds of the men who are fighting the New World Order, it must be understood by all the rest of us who don't understand any of this. Or we are surely lost. The history of the early church testified to the fulfillment of Jesus' words. As the fires of persecution were kindled, Christians were stripped of their possessions and driven from their homes. Great numbers sealed their testimony with their blood. Noble and slave, rich and poor, it didn't matter, learned and ignorant, were alike slain without mercy. And unless what is coming is stopped, this will repeat itself. These persecutions beginning under Nero, the emperor of Rome, A.D. 55-68, to about the time of the martyrdom of Paul, continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be the cause of all the calamities, famine, pestilence, and earthquake. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as enemies of religion, and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts or burned alive in the amphitheaters. Some were crucified. Others were covered with the skins of wild animals and thrust into the arena to be torn by dogs. And vast multitudes assembled to enjoy these sights and greeted their dying agonies with laughter and applause. Or, in that day, it was known as the great Roman circus, the football, the Super Bowl of that era. Because they were hunted like beasts of prey, early Christians were forced to seek concealment in desolate and solitary places. Beneath the hills outside the city of Rome, long galleries were tunneled through earth and rock. A dark and intricate network of passages extended for miles beyond the city walls. In these underground retreats, the followers of Christ buried their dead. When the life-giver shall return to awaken those who fought the good fight, many a martyr for Christ's sake will come forth from those gloomy catacombs. In vain... Were Satan's or Lucifer's efforts to destroy the Church of Christ by violence? 
You see, God's workmen were slain, but his work went steadily forward. Said a Christian, quote, You may torment, afflict, and vex us. The more we are mowed down, the more we spring up again. The blood of Christians is seed, unquote. Tertullian, in his Apology, paragraph 50, Thousands were imprisoned and slain, but others sprang up to fill their place. Now the great adversary, who Christians believe is Satan, also known as Lucifer, but whom the mystery schools believe is Jehovah or Yahweh, the great adversary endeavored to gain by artifice what he had failed to secure by force. Persecution ceased, and in its place were substituted the dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honor. For if they could not stamp out the Christians by violence, by killing them, by crucifying them, by throwing them to the lions and to the dogs and to the gladiators, if they could not get rid of them in that manner, and if the empire was threatened by them, then there had to be a way to save the Roman Empire, to save the emperor from that pestilence known as Christianity. Idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith while they rejected other essential truths. They professed to accept Jesus as the Son of God and to believe in his death and resurrection, but they had no conviction of sin and felt no need of repentance or of a change of heart. With some concessions on their part, they proposed that Christians should make concessions, that all might unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Now the church was in fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire, and sword were blessings in comparison with this. Some of the Christians stood firm, declaring that they could make no compromise. Others were in favor of yielding or modifying some features of their faith and uniting with those who accepted a part of Christianity, urging that this might be the means of their full conversion. And that was a time of deep anguish for the faithful followers of Christ, according to the written history of the Christian religion. This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, foretold the great apostasy. Quote, That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God." Unquote. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, and that prophecy has come true. As man stands in the temple of the body today and declares himself to be God. And furthermore, the apostle warned his brethren, that the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And what is the mystery of iniquity? It is the mystery religion of Babylon, the worship of the heavens, the Osirian cycle, of which the sun is the symbol of the intellect. Even at that early date, he saw creeping into the church errors that would prepare the way for the development of that gigantic system of false religion, a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne and rule the earth according to his will. The nominal conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing in the world cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church, Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Pagan doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. And the Ten Commandments were changed to permit idols in the church. And other changes were made. You see, the day of rest was changed from the seventh day to the first day. Why? Because the first day was the date that the pagan religion worshipped the sun. Osiris, the light. Lucifer, the intellect. 
And so the pure and simple teachings of Christ were corrupted beyond recognition. As Christians consented to lower their standards, a union was formed between, between Christianity and paganism. Though the worshippers of idols professed to be converted, they united with the church, still clinging to their idolatry, only changing the objects of their worship to images of Jesus and even of Mary and the saints. But they still worshipped the same gods. And they always have. If you look at an aerial view of the Vatican, you will see that the outer courtyard is a round temple of the sun, exactly as the Druids and the Celts built. And that in the center of the temple to the sun, to Osiris, stands the symbol of the lost word of Freemasonry, the phallus, the generative force, the penis of Osiris, the obelisk. You see, folks, the Roman Empire never fell. It just became the Catholic Church. And the Roman Emperor merely changed his name from Emperor to Pope. Now, for those of you who may think that I'm crazy and that I've lost my mind, I'm going to read you verbatim from a book entitled Dungeon, Fire, and Sword. It is the complete history of the Knights Templar and the Crusades, written by John J. Robinson, author of Born in Blood. And I'm going to start at the second, third paragraph on page 414 in the chapter entitled Jesus Wept, 1292-1305. That's a date. Those are dates, folks. In London, Edward sent for the Master of the Knights Templar in England, Brian de Jay. He told the Master of his plans to chastise the upstart William Wallace in Scotland and ask that the Templar Knights go with him to fight for England. The Templar Master saw no barrier to committing his knights to a totally secular war that had nothing to do with religion or the true cross. It had been years since the fighting men of the Temple had had anyone to fight. The calls for men and money no longer came from the headquarters in the East. They had no need for them. No monarch they knew in Europe was going to go on a crusade, if even the Pope should call it, which he wouldn't, because the Pope had something much more important on his mind. Boniface VIII had come up with a way to increase the papal treasury, a way that could come only once in a hundred years. The following year of 1299 marks the turn of a century, and Boniface would turn the usual secular celebration into a jubilee of joy for all Christians. Now there would be new pathways to the total remission of sins, much easier than going off on crusade. Full absolution was offered to any pilgrim who would come to Rome for fifteen days with his offering for the church, and thus he could fill his coffers. Even at his most optimistic, the Pope had not foreseen the flood of pilgrims that would bring new prosperity to Rome. The local merchants and innkeepers were delighted with the business generated by almost two million pilgrims. Two priests stood all day and night behind the altar at the Church of St. Paul, using rakes to drag away the steady stream of gold and silver offerings placed there by pilgrims who pushed their way through the mob to leave their gifts. Boniface VIII was ecstatic. He remembered the words said to him as the papal crown had been placed on his head. Quote, Take the tiara, and know that thou art the father of princes and kings, the ruler of the world, the vicar on earth of our Savior Jesus Christ, unquote. Now he indeed felt like the ruler of the world, as he staged a regal pageant. He put on the dress and the insignia of the ancient Roman emperors and went out into the streets with two swords held high in front of him, indicating his supreme authority over both the secular and the spiritual worlds with heralds crying out, quote, Behold, I am Caesar, unquote. And this is just one example, because all through history the popes have, on occasion, made public admittance of the fact that Rome just became the church, displayed on the walls of the Vatican, is the double-headed eagle 
the insignia of only one man who has ever lived, the Emperor of Rome. Now, so that I may not be accused of invention, folks, everything that I am giving you in this broadcast is coming right out of the writings of the historians of the Catholic Church, of the Protestant Church, of the Roman Empire, of the Knights Templar, and many others. You see, I'm not inventing any of this. It happens to be historical fact. And if you have eyes and can see, the emperor, now the pope, to gain converts from heathenism, unsound doctrine, superstitious rites, and the adoration of images and relics were gradually introduced into Christian worship. The decree of a general council, the Second Council of Nice, A.D. 787, finally established this system of Christian idolatry. To complete the sacrilegious work, Rome presumed to erase the second commandment, forbidding image worship from the law of God, and to divide the tenth commandment to preserve the number. According to Christian historians in the Protestant Church, Satan tampered with the fourth commandment also, and purposed to set aside the ancient Sabbath, the day which God had blessed and sanctified, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, and in its stead to exalt the festival observed by the heathen as the venerable day of the sun. This change was not at first attempted openly. In the first centuries, the true Sabbath had been kept by all Christians. They were jealous for the honor of God, and they zealously guarded the sacredness of its precepts. But with great subtlety, Satan worked through his agents to bring about his object. Now don't go away, folks. We've got to take a short break. We'll be right back after this short pause. Early in the 4th century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. The Day of the Sun was reverenced by his pagan subjects and was honored by Christians. It was the emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathenism and Christianity to save the Roman Empire. He was urged to do this by the bishops of the church who perceived that if the same day was observed by both Christians and the heathen, it would promote the nominal acceptance of Christianity by pagans and thus advance the power and glory of the church. But while most Christians were gradually led to regard Sunday as possessing a degree of sacredness, some still held the true Sabbath holy, and they continued to observe it in obedience to the fourth commandment. Now they believed that Satan had led the Jews, before the advent of Christ, to load down the Sabbath with the most rigorous exactions, making its observance a burden. He cast contempt upon it as a Jewish institution until finally the pagan Sunday came to be honored as a divine institution, while the Bible Sabbath was pronounced a relic of Judaism and its observers were at last declared to be accursed. And the outcome of this is that the Jews have been persecuted throughout history. They have become the scapegoat that you learned about in an earlier broadcast. The spirit of concession to paganism opened the way for a still further disregard of heaven's authority. The visible head of the church, the Pope, came to be almost universally acknowledged as the vice-regent of God on earth, and he was endowed with authority over church and state. More than this, the Pope appropriated the very titles of deity. He styled himself, quote, Lord God the Pope, unquote, assumed infallibility and demanded that all men pay him homage. Faith was transferred from Christ, the true foundation of the Christian Church, to the Pope of Rome. Instead of trusting in Christ for forgiveness of sins and for eternal salvation, people looked to the Pope and to the priests and prelates to whom he delegated authority. They were taught that the Pope was their earthly mediator, and that none could approach God except through him, and further, that he stood in the place of God to them, and was therefore to be implicitly obeyed. A deviation from his requirements was cause for the severest punishment to be visited upon the bodies and souls of the offenders. Through this error, the people were turned from God to fallible, erring men. 
Blasphemous titles claimed for the Pope have been embellished and enlarged over the centuries, but a few of these boastful claims appear in a an ecclesiastical Roman Catholic dictionary. I'm taking this right out of a Roman Catholic dictionary by Lucius Ferraris, entitled Prompta Bibliotheca Canonica, Volume 6, pages 438, 442, article Pope, the Catholic Encyclopedia 1913 edition, Volume 6, page 48, speaks of this book as a veritable encyclopedia of religious knowledge and a precious mine of information. Those are the words of the Vatican. Quote, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. Unquote. Remember, the Roman emperors were deified. Quote, Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. Unquote. That is an exact word-for-word -word description of Osiris. Quote, so that if it were possible that the angels might err in the faith or might think contrary to the faith, they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope. Unquote. Quote, the Pope is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, Chief King of Kings, having plenitude of power, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction, not only of the earthly, but also of the heavenly kingdom, unquote. Now, if that's not blasphemy, according to the definition, then I don't know what is, folks. Quote, the Pope can modify divine law, and since his power is not of man, but of God, unquote. The Pope can modify divine law? Well, you see that he did. He changed the day of rest, dictated by God, from the seventh day to the first day, and he changed the Ten Commandments to allow the worship of idols. But the doctrine of papal supremacy is directly opposed to the teachings of any scripture that I am able to find. Quote, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Quote, unquote. That's in Luke chapter 4, verse 8. God has never given a hint in his word that he appointed any man but Christ to be the head of the church. The Bible exalts God and places finite men in their true position. The Pope has no power over Christ's church except by usurpation, and that's true only if you are a Christian. If you are a Jew, if you are a Muslim, if you are a Buddhist, none of that is true, is it? By the 6th century, folks, the papacy was firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city, and the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. Pagan Rome had given place to papal Rome. The ascension of the Roman church to power marks the beginning of the Dark Ages. As her power increased, the darkness of superstition and error deepened. Those were days of pearl for the Church of Christ, Faithful standard-bearers were few. At times, it seemed that error and superstition would wholly prevail, and true religion would be banished from the earth. The gospel was lost sight of, and the forms of religion were multiplied. People were taught not only to look to the Pope as their mediator, but to trust to works of their own to atone for sin. Long pilgrimages, acts of penance, the worship of relics, the erection of churches, shrines, and altars, the payment of large sums to the church, these and many similar acts were enjoined to appease the wrath of God or to secure his favor. As if God were like men, to be angered at trifles or pacified by gifts or acts of penance, and even then the church still worshipped the old gods. For in dismantling churches for renovation throughout Europe, throughout Europe, without exception, and the older the church, the more likely it was to be true. Enshrined within the altar, out of sight of the priests and the worshippers, were found stone penises. Symbols of the lost word of Freemasonry, the phallus of Osiris, the generative force of the pagan religion of the worship of the sun, the light, Lucifer, the intellect. This is historic fact. This is not invention, but fact. About the close of the 8th century, Papist 
put forth the claim that in the first ages of the church the bishops of Rome had possessed the same spiritual power which they now assumed. To establish this claim, ancient writings were forged by monks, and it has been proven that they were forged. Decrees of councils before unheard of were discovered, establishing the universal supremacy of the Pope from the earliest times, and a church that had rejected the truth greedily accepted these deceptions. Another step in papal assumption was taken when in the 11th century Pope Gregory VII proclaimed the perfection of the Roman Church. Among the propositions which he put forth was one declaring that the Church had never erred, nor would it ever err according to the Scriptures. But I wonder what they told Galileo when they imprisoned him for being right that the earth revolved around the sun and that the earth was not the center of the universe and that the universe did not revolve around the earth. I wonder what they told Galileo. How did they justify being right when they were obviously wrong, and not only with Galileo, but Giordano Bruno and many others? Many, many others, as a matter of fact, many of whom were burned at the stake for daring to disagree with what was then considered to be politically correct. For many of them had discovered scientific truths, and when they espoused these truths, were declared to be heretics and were burned at the stake, because the Pope declared these truths to be falsehoods. And that, folks, was the birth of the doctrine known as political correctness. And you see it reappearing now, where truths are again declared to be false, because they are not politically correct. What are you going to accept in this world? Now, once again, I want to tell you, we're not attacking anyone. I care not what you believe. I care not what altar you worship at, for I am a true constitutionalist. It makes no difference to any of you what my religion is, although I will freely tell you, tell you that I attempt in my daily life to follow the true words of Christ, not the doctrine or the preachings of any church or any evangelist or any book, but those words attributed to Christ and only to Christ. And, as the rock upon which those words stand, the Ten Commandments as given to Moses by God, that is the sum total of my religion, of my beliefs, of what I practice in my daily life. I'm not asking you to do that at all. But I am asking everyone to quit accepting what they are told, to begin an honest, individual, personal search for the truth. For we can no longer live in deception. We can no longer live the lies of the past. Great change lies ahead of us, folks. Change will come whether we want it or not, but that is the way of the world and the way of the universe. And if we are still living in lies and deceptions and manipulations, then that change will be for the bad, just as it has always been throughout the history of the world, and blood will flow and people will suffer, all in the name, once again, of religion. And I, for one, am sick of it. Sick of it. We must discover the truth, and we must lead our lives by the truth, and we must take the truth into the future, and we must determine the future from the truth, and nothing else. Nothing else. Or if we do not, those who have decided that they are the only truly mature minds and thus the only ones capable of rule because the rest of us do not use our intelligence and thus are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent, no better than animals who do not have intelligence, they have determined that they are going to shackle us once again in slavery because we cannot control ourselves or rule ourselves or live by the truth. This is what they have determined, right or wrong, whether you believe them or whether you believe that they know what they claim that they know or not. It is what they have determined, and I assure you they are in control right now. 
right now, right this moment, and in this country, their headquarters is in the temple without windows exactly 13 blocks from the White House, the headquarters of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Now, when the Pope declared that the Church had never erred, nor would it ever err, according to the Scriptures, the scriptural proofs did not accompany the assertion. Next, the proud pontiff claimed the power to depose emperors and declared that no sentence which he pronounced could be reversed by anyone, but that it was his prerogative to reverse the decisions of all others. The advancing centuries witnessed a constant increase of error in the doctrines put forth from Rome. Even before the establishment of the papacy, the teachings of heathen philosophers had received attention and exerted an influence in the church. Prominent among these was the belief in man's natural immortality and his consciousness in death. This doctrine laid the foundation upon which Rome established the invocation of saints and the adoration of the Virgin Mary. From this sprang also the heresy of eternal torment for the finally impenitent, which was early incorporated into the papal faith. And thus, uh, once again, the worship of Osiris and Mary and the child Horus, disguised under different names, emerged as a religion from the veil out into the open. The only thing that has changed is the names. Then the way was prepared for the introduction of still another invention of paganism, which Rome named purgatory and employed to terrify the superstitious multitudes. By this heresy is affirmed the existence of a place of torment in which the souls of such as have not merited eternal damnation are to suffer punishment for their sins and from which when freed from impurity they are admitted to heaven. The scriptural ordinance of the Lord's Supper was supplanted by the idolatrous sacrifice of the Mass. Papist priests pretended by their senseless mummery to convert the simple bread and wine into the actual body and blood of Christ. And those are the exact words, body and blood of Christ, written by Cardinal Wiseman. The real presence of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Eucharist proved from Scripture Lecture 8, Section 3, Paragraph 26, but no scripture is quoted. With blasphemous presumption, they openly claimed the power of creating God, the creator of all things. All Christians were required on pain of death to avow their faith in this horrible, heaven-insulting heresy, and multitudes who refused were given to the flames, were burned at the stake. Is it any Wonder that the invisible college, the worshippers of mystery Babylon, those who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages, hate Christianity? Still, another fabrication was needed to enable Rome to profit by the fears and vices of her adherents, and this was supplied by the doctrine of indulgences. Full remission of sins, past, present, and future, and release from all the pains and penalties incurred, were promised to those who would enlist in the pontiff's wars to extend his temporal dominion to punish his enemies, or to exterminate those who dared deny his spiritual supremacy. The people were taught that by the payment of money to the church they might free themselves from sin and release the souls of their deceased friends who were confined in the tormenting flames. By such means, Rome filled her coffers and sustained the magnificent luxury and vice of the pretended representatives of him who had not where to lay his head. And the old Roman Empire flourished under the guise of the Vatican, the papacy, the Catholic Church. In the 13th century was established that most terrible of all the engines of the papacy, the Inquisition. The Prince of Darkness worked through the leaders of the papal hierarchy in their secret councils. Satan and his angels controlled the minds of evil men who invented tortures too horrible to appear to human eyes. Babylon the Great was drunken with the blood of the saints. The mangled forms of millions of martyrs cried to God for vengeance upon that apostate power. This is word to word from history, folks. 
Popery became the world's despot. Kings and emperors bowed to the decrees of the Roman pontiff. The destinies of men, both for time and for eternity, seemed under his control. For hundreds of years, the doctrines of Rome had been extensively and implicitly received. Its rites reverently performed and its festivals observed. Its clergy were honored and liberally sustained, but the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. That was written by J.A. Wiley in the History of Protestantism. Now, Protestantism is not lily-white either. I use that term lily-white because throughout history it's been used to describe good. But in fact, in many instances, there's nothing good about it whatsoever. Protestantism, folks, began in the Reformation. When Martin Luther rebelled against the Pope. But did you know that Martin Luther used as his personal seal the rose and the cross, revealing that he himself, he himself was an initiate of the mystery school, the ancient religion of Babylon. You see, I'm not attacking anyone, and I'm not putting anyone on a pedestal. I'm not tearing down the Vatican, in order to build up the Protestant church, for they are equally guilty. Protestantism has fractured the teachings of Christ into thousands of sects and cults and little groups, all of them professing to know the truth. None of them really do. The Holy Scriptures were almost unknown, not only to the people, but to the priests. God's law, the standard of righteousness in those days, having been removed, Papist leaders exercised power without limit and practiced vice without restraint. Fraud, avarice, and profligacy prevailed. Men shrank from no crime by which they could gain wealth or position. The palaces of popes and prelates were scenes of the vilest debauchery. Some of the reigning pontiffs were guilty of crimes so revolting that secular rulers endeavored to depose these dignitaries of the church as monsters too vile to be tolerated. For centuries, Europe made no progress in learning arts or civilization. A moral and intellectual paralysis had fallen upon the world. The noon of the papacy, according to history, was the midnight of the world. Foremost among those who were called to lead the church from the darkness of popery into the light of a pure faith stood Martin Luther. And this is what people believe, but Martin Luther himself was an initiate of the mystery schools, a follower of the faith of mystery Babylon, as was the pope and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. You see, but they were vying for rulership of the world, and up until not too long ago, have always been throughout history. For the Vatican practices the corrupted worship of Mystery Babylon, the combination of Christianity and the worship of Mystery Babylon, whereas the Mystery Schools retained the pure form of Mystery Babylon. And this is the only difference between the two folks, and they have been vying throughout history for the rulership of the world. Mystery Babylon attempting to destroy the Pope and Christianity, and the Pope attempting to persecute and burn away the followers, the initiates of Mystery Babylon. And it has always been the goal of the worshippers of Mystery Babylon to seat one of their own upon the throne of the Vatican. And they have succeeded. They have succeeded, folks, and now you are seeing the beginning of the combination of all religions into one world religion. And while the world and the New Age movement may be waiting for the emergence of Maitreya, I tell you now here, and remember that I have been the most accurate in making predictions about future world events, than anyone in the history of the world, based upon study and knowledge, not psychic ability, not any gift given to me from God, although I am a messenger, I can assure you of that. 
I tell you that in the New World Order, the One World charismatic and religious leader will be seated upon the throne of Rome. Mark my words. And for those of you who do not understand yet, the Protestant religion was created by the mystery schools to bring down the bring down the authority of the Pope. Just as this nation, the United States of America, was created by the mystery schools to topple the monarchs, the kings and queens, from their thrones. You see, whatever you want to believe in, folks, is okay with me. Let's just believe from a position of knowing the truth. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. From Tinkerbell to Artie Shaw to George Bush's Thousand Points of Light, America has been mesmerized by stardust since its very inception. And now America is beginning to learn what all these references to the star, the morning star, worship on a star, stardust, really is all about. There was something very strange about the classical mysteries. Something which attracted people to them, and having attracted them, made their initiates, with very few exceptions, permanent devotees. In Egypt, Greece, India, Rome, and a dozen other places and countries, sacred initiations took place in specially prepared sanctuaries, usually in a cave or underground. Priests of the mysteries enjoyed the profound respect of the masses, as well as that of kings and counselors, and in those days there was nothing really secret about it except the initiation rites and the knowledge which they retained for themselves, giving only the exoteric to the people. What were the mysteries? Until relatively recently, and relying upon comparatively scattered fragments such as Apollesius' golden ass, historians and religious writers had formed an opinion of them which has been shown to be extremely naive, if not outright false. They knew that at the ceremonies symbolical teaching took place, and hence inferred that the mysteries were a relic of the times when academic knowledge was guarded by the very few, and scientific truths such as Pythagorean theorems were given only, and only, to the elect. They knew also that orgiastic drumming and dancing formed a part of many of the rituals, and therefore told their readers that this was a degenerate form of religion, or a mere excuse for licentiousness. They found that stories of ancient gods and heroes were recited, and were sure that the mysteries constituted little more than an underground survival of prehistoric religion, magic, or tribal initiation. Or maybe that's exactly what they wanted us to believe, knowing full well that it was false. And, of course, if those who did the writing were members of the mysteries, they would never have allowed the secrets to be revealed to the profane. But times have changed, folks. The study of brainwashing and mind control and conditioning the mind within the past decade or so has helped to lay bare the essence of the mysteries and has answered the riddles which surrounded them. You see in this process, those who had tried to keep the celebration of the mysteries alive, who had tried to revive them, have been shown up as relying upon the symbolic interpretation alone. And this revelation has been in its own way one of the most startling developments of contemporary religion. You see, for almost anyone, for instance, can get away with telling anyone else that he was an Egyptian priest in a former incarnation, because there is so very little verifiable material available to prove the reverse. It becomes obvious, though, when you attend a party populated by these nuts, when six people introduce themselves as having been Abraham Lincoln in a past life. But let anyone attempt to celebrate any of the ancient mystery cult's rituals, and unless he has a sound idea of how the human mind works, he is likely to escape the criticism of those physiologists who now see in the mysteries an almost open book. So let us return to a sketch of the conventional knowledge about the mysteries. And those of Eleusis celebrated in Greece, the candidate had to undergo fasting or abstinence from certain foods 
There were processions with sacred statues carried from Athens to Eleusis. Those who were to be initiated waited for long periods of time outside the hall in the temple where the rites were to be held, building up a tremendous tension of suspense. Eventually, a torchbearer led them within the precincts, usually underground. The ceremonies included a ritualistic meal, one or two dramas, the exhibition of sacred objects, the giving of the word, <laughs> an address by the hierophant, and oddly enough, closure with the Sanskrit words, Tensha Ampaksha. The elements included the clashing of symbols, tension, and a certain degree of debilitation. Eating something, plus conditions which were awe-inspiring, strange, the candidate was in the hands of and guided by the priesthood. Other factors were drinking a soporific drop, symbolic sentence of death, whirling around a circle. Initiation ceremonies of secret cults and the mystery type invariably involved tests, sometimes most severe ones. The effect of certain experiences was a carefully worked program of mind training which is familiar in modern times as that which is employed by certain totalitarian states to condition or reshape the thinking of an individual. Are you listening to me, all you Freemasons out there who think that you're so smart? Well, you're not. This process produces a state in which the mind is pliant enough to have certain ideas implanted, ideas which resist a great deal of counter-influence. This was the secret of the mysteries, this and nothing else. Echoes of such training are to be seen in the rituals of certain secret societies without mystical pretensions which survive to this day. Trials, terror, expectancy, drinking, and the rest. That this fact was known in the past, folks, is evidenced by the words of Aristotle, who was exiled because he was said to have revealed something about the mysteries, and he said this, quote, Those who are being initiated do not so much learn anything as experience certain emotions and are thrown into a special state of mind, unquote. Well, what was this special state of mind? Folks, it was a plasticity in order that the conditioning might take permanent root. The psychologist William Sargent, the greatest authority on this subject, says in his classic Battle for the Mind, quote, It seems, therefore, that there are common final paths which all individual animals, though initial temperamental responses to imposed stresses very greatly, must finally take. If only stresses are continued long enough, this is probably the same in human beings, and if so, may help to explain why excitatory drumming, dancing, and continued bodily movement are so much used in such a number of primitive religious groups. The efforts and excitement of keeping the dance in progress for many hours on end should wear down and, if need be, finally subdue even the strongest and most stubborn temperament such as might be able to survive frightening and exciting talk alone for days or weeks, unquote. Now, understanding what I just read to you, this quote from Battle for the Mind by William Sargent, can you still say that music plays no part in the conditioning of the mind? That the words in the music is not being entrapped by the subconscious of those young people who dance for hours listening to this music? If so, I think you'd better rethink that position. For it is a form of mind control, brainwashing. Dr. Sargent notes that Chinese experiments in mass excitation Breaking down and reconditioning are based on the same physiological principles as religious conversion and also group and individual psychotherapy treatments. Folks, these include the application of tension, fear, anxiety, conflict to the point where the subjects are uncertain. 
And in this state, suggestibility is increased and the old pattern of behavior is disrupted. The fact that the devotees of the mysteries were thoroughly conditioned to them and felt that they were important in their lives is seen in much historical evidence. Even in the fourth century of the Christian era, the Greeks were insisting that they, quote, would consider life unbearable if they were not allowed to celebrate those most sacred mysteries which unite the human race, unquote. Now, the work of those who have pointed out the function of the mysteries as mind training and conditioning has, of course, evoked no answer from those who still think that the rituals are mere symbolic representations of knowledge or facts. And indeed, they cannot admit this simply because they would be admitting their own foolishness and stupidity in the process. So they will resist at all costs and continue to go to their meetings for to do otherwise would be to confront their own fallibility. And in human nature, that is one of the most difficult things for any individual to do. We all realize that. It's interesting to note, folks, that the ecstasy which is produced by excitatory methods and is followed by manipulation of the mind is still sought by members of many secret cults who are aware of the scientific explanation. You see, irregardless, even when they know this, they still seek it out because for them it fulfills some terrible need way down deep inside their gut. The reaction is that the experience may well be induced by physical methods, but in spite of that, and this is what they say, quote, it is nothing less than actual spiritual communion with a supernatural power, unquote. This is the point at which scientists and mystics cannot agree. The mystic feels sure that he has experienced something sublime, and who's to say that they haven't? For if you have not experienced it, you have no basis upon which to make a decision. But to experience it is to put yourself in a position to be controlled by others. So, we are in a quandary now. How do we explore this? The scientist tells the mystic that it is an illusion. He just simply will not believe it. The situation reminds one of the time when someone produced the soul of a departed relative to tell a spiritualist that there was no life after death. <laughs> Although this is alleged to have happened in Ireland, one can visualize it taking place easily enough in the mutually heated atmosphere of scientists versus mystic anywhere in the world. The orgiastic side of the mysteries also has a place in the sphere of psychology. The catharsis, or the cleansing of the mind, which the secret cult of the cathari experienced after ecstasy, is paralleled by the modern therapist's procedure in bringing his patient to a state of excitement and then collapse before implanting what he considers more suitable ideas in the mind. Christianity, of course, has not been behind in its use of the mystery system for initiates, for it was not until A.D. 692 that every believer was ordered to be admitted to the worship of the Christians, following the period when it was thought advisable to celebrate certain parts of worship in secret. You see, Christianity in the beginning was a secret society itself, and the correct name for it was the Friendly Open Secret Society, although in the beginning there was nothing open about it. Traces of this survive in such customs as that of the Greek Orthodox Church, where the priest celebrates divine worship behind a curtain, which is only taken away during the elevation of the host. Quote, since at that moment the worshippers prostrate themselves and are not supposed to see the Holy Sacrament, unquote. The reason given for the secrecy of the practice of the Christian cult gives a clue in explaining that the celebrant must be prepared by expectation. St. Augustine laid down that secrecy was essential because 
the mysteries of Christianity were incomprehensible to human intellect and should not be derided by the uninitiated. Secondly, because this secret produced greater veneration for the rites. Thirdly, that the holy curiosity of those to be initiated into the experience of Christianity should be increased in order that they might attain to a perfect knowledge of the faith. And to tell you quite frankly, folks, in my study of mind control, the Christian church would swell well beyond any conception or imagination of what their numbers could be if they had continued their secrecy. St. Basil, the Spiritus Sanctu, uh, cap, let me see, that's uh, the 17th, that's a writing, folks, tells how the fathers of the church, quote, were well instructed to preserve the veneration of the mysteries in silence. For how could it be proper publicly to proclaim in writing the doctrine of those things which no unbaptized person may so much as look upon, unquote. Now this all sounds silly to us today. Believe me, folks, there is nothing silly about it. And if it were practiced today as it was then, the Christian church would be more powerful than you could possibly conceive. Now remember, this is the results of our research. I myself consider myself to be a Christian, and that I follow the teachings, the words of Christ in my daily life, not the dogma of any church, not the preaching of any minister or priest, but simply and only the words of Christ. Seated upon the foundation of that which God gave us early in our history, the moral code called the Ten Commandments, as they were originally given to Moses, and not as they were changed by man in the form of the Pope. The origin of mystery ceremonies seems to be India, or at least the place and time when the Brahmin priesthood started its initiations. The ceremonies were based upon the Hindu myths, but the procedure followed in training the aspirant is strikingly similar in Egypt, and Egypt profoundly influenced Greece. Now what's left out here? And the reason it's usually left out is because any mention or discussion of the Babylonian mysteries or the Babylonian religion is usually met with much criticism and derision by those who believe that it was a terrible institution. The mysteries definitely came from the East, and the East in the mysteries still survives today. When one... Freemason greets another, and he's not sure if he's really a Freemason. He'll ask him if he's a traveler, or if he's traveling, or if he is a fellow traveler. All, I might add, were the same code of identification used by the Communist Party in this country. Because communism and the mysteries are the same entity as are socialism and the mysteries. When they meet, and this exchange takes place, the one being queried if he is indeed a member of the mystery religion will say, yes, I'm a traveler, to which the first or the inquirer will respond with, where are you going or where are you traveling from where to where? And the answer will be from west to east. For the east is the position of the rising sun where the knowledge comes from. You see, for an early history, it certainly can be proven to have come from the East. And the sun was the symbol of the intellect. It began by being sim the symbol of the unseen God of the universe, and slowly transformed into the symbol of the intellect, the light of Cyrus, Ra, Lucifer. Prayer, fasting, and study were the first requirements when the Indian candidate prepared himself for the trials which were before him. All of this, folks, originated in Babylon at the dawn of civilization. 
For the actual sight of the great gods and for the final word or teaching which would be implanted in his mind when it had become sufficiently prepared to receive it. And if the weather was cold, he would have to sit in the snow or rain naked. In the torrid heat, he sat in the full blaze of the sun with four fires built around him to give additional heat. And this was the first part of the undertaking. While he repeated prayers and repetitions, which included the invocation for his complete conversion. This latter concentration folks upon the desires of the candidate is applied in more than one of the mysteries. Some of the initiation ceremonies were cruel and painful. Coupled with the word which is given during the ceremonies, it means that the power of suggestion is being applied continuously and should penetrate into the mind at every moment when it is able to receive it. This period of dedication was succeeded by one in which he visited the underground cave of initiation, and when it wasn't in a cave, it was in a tomb or a crypt, such as the pyramids of Egypt, which were never tombs of pharaohs, but were, from the beginning until the end of their use, they were temples of initiation. Passing through a tunnel of complete darkness, the initiate emerged into the cavern where three priests, dressed as gods, awaited him in resplendent and intimidating array. After being addressed and partaking in the oration of prayers, the initiate walked rapidly around the temple several times, this called circumambulation, and was then carried through several subterranean and unlit caves. During this time, there were wails, wails, screams, and shouts from every side, while illuminated specters and other horrors abounded. At the end of this terrible experience, the aspirant came to two doors, which, when thrown open to the sound of the sacred conch trumpet, the conch, folks, is a shell, revealed a scene of brilliance and glory. This hall was full of every delight in the form of pictures, music, and perfume. The initiate walked to an altar in the room where he was again harangued and presented with his sevenfold cord which marked his passing through the initiation. Now if we compare these proceedings with those which were said to be carried out among the Egyptians, the parallelism is startling even today. The candidate was taken to a well, which he had to descend until he came to a tunnel. Torch in hand, he passed through a door, which closed with a resounding noise, as if never to be opened again. He was met by frightful figures, which offered him a last chance of going back. Then he passed through a fire, swam through a dangerous underground stream, and as soon as he reached a door and touched a ring to open it, a blast of air blew out the lamp, which gave the only available light. Some type of machine swung him over a bottomless pit, and just as he was on the point of exhaustion, an ivory door opened, and he found himself on the threshold of the resplendent temple of Isis. Here the priests received him into their company. After this series of tests, he had to undergo fasting and what would nowadays be called indoctrination, before he could be considered completely initiated into even the first degree. The foregoing experiences were followed by the higher degrees, those of Serapis and Osiris. And in the process, the wives of the priests would tease him and control him and try to get him to make love to them. And if he successfully resisted, then he could say that he had passed all the tests. But if he succumbed to their advances, he was not considered worthy. It is needless to outline the beliefs and methods used in the Chinese, Japanese, South American, and other mysteries, because while the legends which are inculcated may vary in some way, they are all essentially and basically the same. The training hardly varies at all. 
The real mystery of the mysteries, folks, is how and when man first discovered the use of certain procedures to condition other men and thus rule them and control them, and whether the discovery was instantaneous or gradual, or simultaneous or at different times and places. But one cannot date doctrines as one can archaeological finds by radioactive carbon dating. And so you've reached another milestone in your education into the mysteries, and this program has only half completed. And again, I must remind you that we have just begun, for we are essentially covering 6,000 years of the history of a hidden religion known simply as the Mysteries. To Christians, it is Mystery Babylon. To others, it is called the Invisible College. In all cases, it belongs to those who consider themselves in possession of the only truly mature minds, and thus the only ones capable of knowing certain advancements in technology, sociology, and many, many other things. They call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages. And I can assure you folks, they are in complete control of all elements of our society, military, and government at this time. So it is essential that you learn these facts about them and their organization so that we can decide our future. Don't go away, folks. We've got to take a short break. I'll be right back right after this pause. The Cult of Mithra, the intercessor between man and the Persian divine power, or Muz, was once an extremely widespread one, for it is the original cult of the sun. From its origins in Persia, the faith spread to Babylonia, Greece, and finally the Roman Empire, where it struggled against Christianity at the latter's inception. Christianity believes that it won with the decline of the material virtues of the Romans, but there are people who worship the solar deity today, and even London has its Mithra temple. Mithra was said to give his worshippers success in this world, as well as security and happiness in the next. Sound familiar, Freemasons? He was originally a genie, the worldly representative of the invisible power, which ruled the affairs of men. Later, and the cult probably has a history of over 6,000 years, he became thought of by his devotees as being not just one of the 28 genera, but the only one which mattered, and the only one who could cater for the wishes and needs of the people. Thus it was that the ancient Aryan worship of Ahura Mazda, the supreme being, was displaced by that of one of his representatives. Now one way, folks, you can tell who or which corporations or businesses our societies belong to these cults, is to look at these names, such as Saturn, Mazda, etc. Ahura Mazda, the supreme being, was displaced by that of one of his representatives, although archaeological research has produced little to give a clear picture of the rituals and beliefs of the Misraists. A considerable amount of secret lore still survives in the East from India to Syria, which gives one a good idea of exactly how the members of the cult thought and just exactly what their magical ceremonies were. Three ritualistic objects are used by Mithraeus, the crown equivalent to the sun and power of the supernatural kind, the hammer or club symbolizing creative activity of mankind, and the bull, which stands for nature, virility, increase. By the proper understanding of these objects, and just exactly what they represent, Mithraeus 
habit that the ordinary man can transcend his environment, can become great or successful, or can achieve what he wants to do and enters a delightful afterlife. What must he give in exchange? Nothing but worship to the principle which presides over all destiny and control to the priests of the religion. Now let's regress just a moment and let me explain to you why the bull. Throughout the ancient world you see the symbology of the bull. Now you have to remember this history goes back 6,000 years, the first 2,000 of which looking back is the Christian era. Now, remember, this is the age of Pisces, or the two fish. The 6,000-year period started in antiquity when the sun was in Taurus, or the bull. That is the meaning of Baal, or Baal. The golden calf was the representation of the house of the sun, or the age of the bull, or Taurus. It was really the same old mystery religion the worship of the unseen God of the universe, represented by the sun, which over the centuries and the millennia has become the worship of the intellect, with the sun the representation of the light. Or Lucifer, the one who gave man the gift of intellect. Now, after the age of Taurus came the goat, or the ram. And this was symbolized by the symbol of the goat, or the goat of Mendes. For in Mendes there was a temple erected to the worship of the mysteries. And since the sun was in the house of the goat or the ram, the object of the exoteric worship by the masses was the goat. When the sun passed into the house of Pisces, or the two fishes, the Christian era began. We are now on our way out of the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. Once you understand that the ancient religion was a religion of the worship of the heavens, then everything begins to come together. And when you understand that they ceased believing in an all-powerful unseen God or hidden God of the universe, and became essentially pantheists, believing that everything is God, they call this nature or the natural way, then you can understand how man became to worship the intellect, the intellect, and the symbol which used to represent the unseen God of the universe came to represent the intellect, the use of which will bring man to the state of apotheosis where man himself will become God. And then you begin to look at all the things that are happening today, and you see their symbology everywhere. Nowhere will you see it more prominently than the Looney Tune fringe element which call themselves ufologists. You will see that everything to do with the so-called UFO phenomena comes right out of the mystery schools. One reason, folks, for the loss of importance of the cult of Mithras, undoubtedly, is the admission was restricted to those who were thought worthy to receive the blessings which would come through the proper beliefs and use of the magical powers presided over by the Mithra priests. Christianity, for instance, was open to a far greater section of the population, even although the Christian mysteries were not accessible everywhere to all until relatively late in our history. At the same time, some of the Mithraic ceremonials were of such obvious emotional appeal that scholars are agreed that the purely ritualistic side of Christianity owes much to those of the sun god of the Persians. And if you've been listening to this program, you already know that that Christianity was actually merged with the religion of the worship of the sun into what is now known as the Vatican. The lowest degree of initiation was known as the sacrament and could be administered to anyone, theoretically, who could be relied upon to keep a secret 
and he would eventually develop into a regular and devout worshiper. This degree was called that of the crow, and it symbolized, according to present-day Mithraeus, the death of the new member from which he would arise reborn as a new man, and today the crow is known as the phoenix. This death, or symbolic death, spelt the end of his life as an unbeliever, and cancels his allegiance to former and unaccepted beliefs. The use of the word crow probably derives from the ancient Persian practice of exposing their dead to be eaten by carrion birds, which is still carried on by the Parsi community in India, who follow parts of ancient Iranian religion as supposedly taught by Zoroaster. But if the crow symbolized death, it was also the delegate privilege to take over the human body after death. Of course, this meant that in a sense it was superior to humanity. Thus it was that the members of the cult was superior to the ordinary run of mortals. They believed themselves to be a separate race of man and still do. The candidate descended seven steps into the temple, which was an underground one, fashioned in the shape of a cavern, and made to look as much as possible like a natural cave. Initiation tests now took place. The newcomer was pursued by wild beasts, priests in animal skins, demons and all sorts of terrors. He had to fast for three days. In this debilitated, altered, and plastic state, he was given a lecture by a priest on the responsibilities which were now his. Among these, for the necessity to call brother only those who had been initiated. In the words of a Freemason today, whose son I happen to know, if you are not one of us, you are nothing. Those words were spoken to his son when he asked his father why the Freemasons that he knew and his father were persecuting a local businessman and trying to drive him out of business. Now bear in mind that his son was not a Freemason. Let me say those words again for you folks. Quote, If you are not one of us, you are nothing. Unquote. All family ties were severed. Nothing mattered except doing one's job well and carrying out the worship of Mithra. The final ceremony took place amid the clash of cymbals, the beating of drums, and the unveiling of a statue of Mithra himself. This latter showed Mithra as a man carrying a bull by the hind legs. Now the symbolism of this piece of sculpture was explained to him. The bull, in addition to symbolizing fecundity, was representative of animal passion, and it was also the house in which the sun dwelt in the first 2,000 years of the religion. It was through invocations to Mithra that mankind first discovered how to overcome this force and how to discipline himself. Therefore, the secret of religion was partly that the worshiper must restrain himself physically in order to attain power over himself and over others. And this is the mystery of the Sphinx that man has been trying to decipher since man discovered the Sphinx in the modern world. It is simply this, that man is nothing but an animal with a brain, with an intellect. It is to remind us, folks, it is to tell us that no matter what you think or how high you get, you are still nothing but an animal with an intellect. Period. This graphic teaching of the diversion of sexual power into psychic channels shows that the Mithraeus followed, in, its, in essence, the pattern of all mystery schools which believed in the production of power through discipline. In this, they are clearly distinguished from the more primitive and less important orgiastic schools which merely practiced indiscriminate indulgence, mass, immorality, and so on. The neophyte, in this initiation, then drank a little wine from the symbol to show that he realized that the symbol is the means whereby ritual ecstasy comes, which puts him in touch with the higher powers. There are two long lines of initiates knelt on either side of the low stone benches which traversed the crypt. 
Remember, George Bush was initiated in the crypt or the tomb at Yale University into what is known as the Skull and Bones, the Russell Trust, the Brotherhood of Death. Now, remember, two lines of initiates knelt on either side of the low stone benches which traversed the crypt and as the new member, accompanied by the priests who were initiated him, walked along the central aisle for the eating of the bread, a number of pieces of dry bread were placed on a drum, similar to those which were being softly beaten by one of the priests. The candidate ate one morsel, signifying that he accepted Mithra as the source of, its, of his food. This bread, according to their beliefs, had been exposed to the rays of the sun to absorb some of its quality, and thus the worshipper was partaking of the nature of the sun itself in this ritual observance. But it goes deeper than that, folks, because the sun is what enables all life to exist on this planet, being that the planet is at the perfect balance where it is either neither too hot nor too cold, and that the planet is tilted upon its axis, creating the seasons which enable food to be grown in the more northern latitudes than if the earth was stable on an axis where only one portion of the globe always was in direct alignment with the sun. Then it would be too hot at the equator. There would be one narrow band in the northern and southern hemisphere where crops could be grown, and it would be too cold in the northern and southern hemispheres. So this ritual observance has scientific fact behind it in that the bread indeed did come from the sun. And now the initiate was taught the password of the cult which was to identify him to other members and which he was to repeat to himself frequently in order to maintain the thought always in his mind. Quote, I have eaten from the drum and drunk from the cymbal and I have learned the secret of religion. Unquote. This is the cryptic phrase which an early Christian writer, Maternus, reports as being taught to the Mithraeus, quote, by a demon, unquote. The second degree of initiation was called the secret, and during this the candidate was brought to a state of ecstasy, in which he was somehow made to believe that he had seen the statue of the god actually endowed with life. Folks, it's not likely that there was any mechanical method by which this was done because no such apparatus has been found in Mithraic temples unearthed. The candidate was brought up to the idol to which he offered a loaf of bread and a cup of water. And this was to signify that he was a servant of the God, and that, quote, by what sustains my life, I offer my entire life to your service, unquote. The grade of soldier may show that the military arts were responsible for a good deal of the power of Mithra worship in ancient Persia. Certain it is, in any case, that this degree greatly appealed to the Roman warriors who formed a very large part of the rank and file of the cult during its western expansion. A sign similar to a cross signifying the sun was made on the forehead of the initiate, who was thus marked as owned by the deity. A crown was placed before him, hanging from the point of a sword. This he took and placed it aside with the words, Mithra alone is my crown. And this, folks, this takes place in every, every mystery that there have ever been. Remember when Christ went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted by Satan? Satan offered him the crowns of any or all of the nations of the earth if he would just follow him, and Christ rejected it. The same thing happens in the mystery school. The initiate is always offered a crown, sometimes by the king or the emperor himself. And if he accepts the crown, he's considered unworthy, and being, as it would be interpreted as a threat to the real wearer of the crown, probably would have been executed. He was considered only worthy if he rejected the crown, symbolic of the ruler the ruling of the nation or people or area. The Persian crown, it should be remembered, from which pattern all present-day crowns are eventually derived, is a golden sun disk 
with a hole in the center for the head. It is jagged at the edges, representing the sun's rays, just like that worn by the Statue of Liberty. And these projections are turned up to make what is still known in Western heraldry as the Oriental Crown. You can also see this representation as the halo in Christian art. Now the candidate has to prove himself in a mock combat with soldiers and animals in a number of caves. When the emperor, Commodus, went through this degree of initiation, he actually killed one of the participants, although he was supposed only to make a symbolic slaying. Passed through the soldier degree, the Mithraeus was eligible, after a lapse of time, to be promoted to the rank of lion. He was taken again to the cavern, and honey was smeared upon his brow as opposed to the water which had been used in his acceptance into the earlier degree, his baptism. The degree of lion was taken only by those who had decided to dedicate themselves completely to the cult, and who would henceforth have no truck with the ordinary world. The lion was, then, a sort of priest, but rather more of a monk. He was trained in the rites of the cult and told certain secrets. The degree of lion of Mithras could only be conferred only when the sun was occupying the zodiacal sign of Leo, and that's about July 21st to August 20th, during the Persian month of Asad, the lion. Now, there's a good deal of astrological lore in Mithraism, and also an admixture with Kabbalistic numerology. The Greek branch of the Mithraists, for example, worked out that the numerical equivalent of the name spelt by them Mitris was 365, and thus corresponded to the number of days in the solar year. Well, since the deity was the sun, then this is exactly what it should have been. In the purely magical sense, Mithraism has it that both the name of the god and the rank which the individual holds in the cult have magical power. Thus, if a person wants to achieve anything, he has to concentrate upon the word Mithra while preparing for himself the ceremonial repast and beating alternately a drum and cymbals. That the effect of initiation was to produce someone of upright character is amply evidenced by literature of the Roman times, in which the Mithraeus were generally considered to be thoroughly trustworthy and improved people. Even their enemies could reproach their own followers with the vitality of the Mithraeus creed. Tertullian, in his De Corona, which is Latin, for the crown, which he composed in the third Christian century, upbraids the Christians, inviting their attention to the Mithraeus as examples. De Corona actually means the crown of thorns. You, his fellow warriors, should blush when exposed by any soldier of Mithra when he is enrolled in the cave. He is offered the crown, which he spurns, and he takes his oath upon this moment and is to be believed through the fidelity of his servants. The devil puts us to shame, he said. Now, there were seven degrees of initiation in all, although there are some branches of the ecstatic side of the lore, which includes certain others, making the total twelve. After Lion came the Persian, then the runner of the sun, then father, and finally father of fathers. The twelfth degree, it is said, is king of kings, and where have we heard that before? And properly, this can be held only by the supreme king, and preferably the Shah Hinshah, or the king of kings of Persia. This very ancient cult, from which more than one present-day secret society is derived, is thus seen to contain many of the elements which underlie organizations of this sort. You see, folks, it is a training system. It attempts to produce in its members a real or imagined experience of contact with some supreme power. The magical element is there, too, shown in the belief in the power of certain names to achieve things which cannot be done by men. Mithraism was not an antisocial society in the sense that it did not conflict in its aims with the objectives of the countries in which it flourished, and hence it did not threaten the established order. It was tolerant of other creeds, just like Freemasonry is now. You can belong to any religion and join at the lowest level. But I guarantee you, when you reach the highest, you will belong to only one religion. 
The tolerance of other creeds meant that it did not attempt to supplant them. Its greatest festival, the birth of the sun, on the 25th of December became Christianized, and it is claimed by those who still believe in its mysteries and celebrate them that Christianity did not so much supplant Mithraism as absorb it, accepting some of its externals and averting them to its own use, and that is exactly what has happened. Perhaps, incongruously, a present-day follower of Mithra in England recently likened this phenomenon to the eclipse of the Liberal Party. Quote, because the two other parties have taken over its objectives and widened the basis, only the actual initiates of Mithra know what has been lost in the process, unquote. So the young man in the firegin bonnet, sometimes seen as the conqueror of the bull or even as a man with a lion's head, still has his devotees. And folks, the sun still shines. So what has all this got to do with stars and stardust? Many people believe that Venus is the morning star. In the ancient days, they say that it was Sirius that rose just before the sun with a red cast to it and then turned a brilliant white as it rose up into the heavens. Well, folks, if you really think about it, the sun is the morning star. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you. Welcome once again, folks, to the Hour of the Time and our ongoing series of the exposure of the origins, the history, the doctrine, and the identity of Mystery Babylon. I'm William Cooper. Many of you have written letters and asked, how does one get into the Mystery School since no one ever hears anything about it? And there appears not to be a campaign of recruitment, and you're absolutely right. In our research, we have found the requirements to be simple. Be of sound mind and body. Have a sincere desire to be illumined and simply knock upon the door. Remember, folks, Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m. to 11, I will be at the Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego. That's Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m. Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego. I will be giving a three-hour presentation entitled The Sacrificed King, and will show you who murdered President John Fitzgerald Kennedy and why. I'm going to be showing you a lot of videotapes, some of which is of the Zapruder film and frames that you've never been allowed to see before. And as soon as you see these frames, you'll know why. You'll also know why that usually the copies of the Zapruder film that have fallen into the public's hands have been extremely poor copies, black and white, very low resolution, usually fourth, fifth, or sixth generation copies of copies. And you will also understand why that has happened also. You will be amazed. Don't miss it. $40 admission. There's several different places where you can uh, get your tickets in advance. One is the Controversial Bookstore in San Diego. I also recommend that uh, bookstore for finding suppressed information. Books that you can't find anywhere else, you can sometimes find at the Controversial Bookstore in San Diego. Now, if you're a CAGI member, the price of admission is only $30. It's only $30. Now remember, folks, this money isn't for me. I'm a paid speaker. I'm invited. I am paid to come and speak at that ed event. The promoters set the price of admission. However, I always negotiate a lower price for CAGI members. Sometimes it's quite substantial. In this case, it's 25%, which is a pretty good discount. But if you're a CAGI member, you're going to have to purchase your tickets at the event. Okay. So, if you're not a CAGI member, you can get your tickets in advance from the Controversial Bookstore in San Diego. If you are a CAGI member, get your tickets at the event, and you will only be charged $30. Now, there's a hotline that you can call and uh, find out about this conference if you wish. It's area code 619-492-8588. That's 619-492-8588. 
And we still need money, folks, to pay for airtime. If you like this show, if you want to see it stay on the air, you'd better contribute. You'd better send something in. Sit down and write a check. Our money order, make it payable to WWCR. I don't want the money. It doesn't go in my pocket. It goes to pay for airtime because no individual, I guarantee you, can afford to pay for airtime on radio like we're doing here. So if you want to see us stay on the air, you're going to have to help out. If you're getting worth from this program, then chip in something, anything. Any amount will be appreciated. We hope that you'll reach way down in your pocket and come up with the most that you can possibly afford. Or set yourself some kind of a schedule and contribute X number of dollars, whatever you can afford each month. That's the best way to do it. Send it to Stan, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Stan, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. If you'd like to call and talk to Stan, ask him to send you an information packet, you may do so at 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Now, recently the telephone company was doing something with a buried cable um, up in the mountains, and it was really messing everything up, and some of you called, and it said that Stan's number was no longer in service. Uh, it's not true, folks. The number is good. You can call Stan and talk to him. Uh, he gets a lot of calls, so if it's busy, just call back at a later time, and you'll usually get through. Please call him during the normal waking hours, not late at night. Uh, Stan and Elma are getting up there in age, and uh, they like their sleep. They're wonderful people. You'll enjoy talking to Stan. And he will send you a packet of information and answer your questions uh, to the best of his ability. If you'd like for me to come and speak in your area, call Stan, talk to him. He'll tell you what it takes to get you there. And uh, it's not difficult, folks, I can assure you. Now, also, we need more CAGI members. The bigger our base of intelligence gathering, the more intelligence we can gather. It just makes sense. Right now, we have a CAGI member attending a press conference with the vice president. That's how powerful our press credentials are. They're real. This is no joke, folks. When you get CAGI press credentials, they're real. It's not a joke. It's not some Looney Tune thing like the Captain Midnight decoder ring. No, this is a real, a real news and commentary program. We have real press credentials. We put out a real newsletter. Soon we hope to be a newspaper. This is no joke. When you join Chaggy, you're expected to gather intelligence, information, news. If you'd like to join Chaggy, send $45 to stand at the address we've already given, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Or give him a call, 602-567-6109. Now, if you're unsure about all this, just ask him for a packet of information, and he'll be happy to send it to you. Well, to continue, remember that the first religion in the world was the religion of the worship of the heavens. And man eventually came to recognize the sun as the representation of the power and the ability of the hidden God of the universe, the invisible God of the universe, the all-powerful creator of everything. But man, as he gained his intellectual ability, began to look toward himself, toward the intellect, as that God and the Son, the representation of what used to be the invisible God of the universe, then became the representation of the intellect, the light, Lucifer. And man began to worship the Luciferian philosophy. He believed these people who call themselves the guardians of the secrets of the ages and still believe that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive, and very cruel God, the God of the Bible, and that he was set free from the bonds of ignorance through the gift of intellect given to him by Lucifer through his agent, Satan. Now, many people believe that Lucifer and Satan are the same individual entity, and they may be. I don't know the answer to that. 
I just know what the mystery schools believe, and I know what I personally believe, and what I personally believe doesn't have any bearing on anything. Knowledge, the truth, is what counts. And that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of here. Now, eventually, this philosophy of worshiping, worshiping the intellect, or wisdom, or the mind, became known as Gnosticism. And the followers of Gnosticism began to be known as the Gnostics. In extraordinary number, folks, of exceedingly bizarre talismans and inscribed stones bear witness to the power of the secret Gnostic organizations, which flourished in various forms during the few centuries immediately before and after the rise of Christianity in the Middle East. You see, one of the oddest emblems of these schools was the figure of a Braxus. Now, that's a human body clothed in a Roman soldier's garb, wielding a battle axe as if threatening an enemy. Now, in its left hand, it carried an elliptical shield upon which the words of power I-A-O and Saboeth were sometimes written. The head of this fearsome being was that of a cock with open beak. Now, that symbolized the rising of the morning sun because the cock crows with the sunrise. For legs that had twin serpents, the serpent throughout history has always been a symbol for wisdom, the gift of intellect, coiling to either side. Underneath the figure sometimes lay a conventionalized thunderbolt. Now who was Abraxas? His name, in accordance with Kabbalistic computation, is decoded to mean 365. Isn't it? Absolutely incredible that every single time we investigate one of these, it leads directly to the sun. For 365 days, or the number of days in the year, or the exact number of days that it takes the earth to make one revolution around the sun. Amazing. There was no god or idol belonging to the society. And this is where man made the transition from worshipping a god to worshipping the mind. The Abraxas figure merely represented the aspects of power which went to make up the supreme intelligence, the all power. The body was man himself. The bird stood for intelligence and the hailing of light, illumination, which is the cock's habit at dawn. The tunic represented the need for struggle or revolution socialism, the arms of the protection and power given by the dedication to the Gnosis, or knowledge. The shield was wisdom, the club or whip, power, the two snakes, Netnus, insight, and logos, understanding, primordial knowing, which was the gift from Satan, the snake, the serpent. By means of this diagram, Gnostic teachers inculcated the theory that man comes to his full power by developing certain facets of his mind. He must struggle to arrive at Gnosis. But this knowledge is of the mystical kind and is not the mere collection of facts. You see, great stress was laid upon personal mystical experience to and through which the initiate was guided under conditions of great secrecy. The Gnostics did not confine their studies or their teachings to any one religion, but borrowed illustrations from all that were accessible to them. This caused them to be considered Christians, heretics, Jews who were trying to undermine Christianity, remnants of the Persian sun worshippers. They have been widely studied by early Christian sages, and it is upon the opinions of these latter that many conclusions have been formed. Little or no investigation of these, quote, people of wisdom, unquote, has been done by research workers on the spot in Asia and North Africa, where strong and interesting traces of their beliefs and practices still remain. The main teaching states that there is a supreme being or power which is invisible and has no perceptible form. It is pantheism. This power is the one which can be contacted by mankind and it is through it that man can control himself and work out his destiny. The various religious teachers through the ages, putting their creeds in many different ways, were in contact with this power, they claim, and the religions all contain a more or less hidden kernel of initiation. 
And this is the secret which the knowers can communicate to their disciples. But the secret can be acquired only through exercising the mind and body until the terrestrial man is so refined as to be able to become a vehicle for the use of this power, or, in their terms, illumined. Eventually, the initiate becomes identified with the power, and in the end he attains his true destiny as purified personality, infinitely superior to the rest of unenlightened mankind to the state of apotheosis, where he himself is God. The symbolism in which this teaching is concealed, the methods by which the mystical power is attained, vary from one Gnostic society to another, but the constant factor is there the attainment of that which humankind unconsciously needs. You see, the Gnostic claims that within every man and woman there is an unfulfilled urge which cannot be given any proper expression in the normal way because there is no social means by which it can be fulfilled. This feeling has been put into man in order that he may seek the fulfillment which the Gnostics can give him. His search for completeness in love trade, professions, theology, is vain and unsuccessful. The theories of the various schools, folks, of Gnosticism with which the Christian clerics came into contact are very much secondary to the rituals and practices which are used to produce the Gnosis, the Enlightenment, the Illumination. This has not been fully understood by too many people who devote much space in trying to work out the beliefs of the knowers by a perusal of their writings or by reports which have been given them by others, simply, folks, because they do not understand the symbolism. It is not clear to them. It is veiled. It is the esoteric wisdom. What were and are the Gnostic practices? Well, first, discipleship and the inculcated belief that the initiate must struggle, must devote himself as much as possible to the identification with the power which inspires all. Secondly, there are two kinds of men. Those who are bound to the earth and to matter, and those who can refine themselves. It is from the latter class that aspirants are chosen. They claim. In every instance that we've investigated, they may choose them from the latter class, but they all end up in the first. Thirdly, the methods by which the divine illumination may come are many and varied, and it is the province of the teacher to choose which path he will give to his disciple to follow. Some Gnostics believe that frenzy and excitement would produce the necessary liberation of the mind from the fetters of the body. Remember the Sphinx? Others consider that this could be done best by fasting and meditation. Present-day Gnostic practice in the East has it that different methods suit different temperaments. And this could be one cause for the historical confusion as to which branch of heretics practiced what. The Gnostics believed themselves to be intellectual aristocrats. Their knowledge was only for the few who were ready to receive it. And that's why they do not recruit. You must knock at the door. And you, and only you, know when you're ready to receive it. And this is what made them a secret cult, not the fear of persecution. They had their own passwords and shaking hands. They tickled the palm as an identification signal. And they helped one another in every conceivable way. Just as Freemasons do today for they are one and the same, as they have always been one and the same with all the different versions of the mystery throughout the ages. Now, some say that they could not be called pantheists because they considered that the doctrine was secondary to the experience of religion, and the theologians and ordinary priesthood of any religion did not approve of that. They were not, in fact, a religion like most others, because they stressed the importance of the individual before that of the community. Those who were more enlightened were more important in every possible way because they were valuable, refined aristocrats. 
At the same time, they taught that providing the well-being of the Gnostics was assured. So was that of the community at large. And this meant that they could subscribe to the outward doctrines of any religion and could continue to operate under many different political religious systems. Gnosticism profoundly influenced men's minds, even in Europe, up to and after the Middle Ages, and its basic way of thinking is probably an underlying factor in other secret societies whose members would be surprised to know it because the pyramidal organizational structure of the membership of these organizations means that nobody below the top, the very top, really knows anything of the true religion and goals of the society to which they belong. And so these people could truly be said to be the greatest group of followers and fools in the history of the world. For they think that they are illumined. But in fact, they are never given any real secrets, and only those at the top truly know what is really going on. Terrible obscenities and other crimes have been laid at the door of the Gnostics by the early ecclesiastical writers, although there is little doubt that some of them did believe in mass ecstasy. It seems unlikely that their secrets were well enough known to enable the commentators to assess them. And in most cases, whenever the commentators tried to assess them, they were assessing the exoteric, or the appearance, but not the esoteric, or the real truth of the object, of the worship of the Gnostics. The belief that certain special men could control their destiny and obtain extra powers through dedication to Gnostic practices meant that inevitably there was a belief in magic. Remember on previous shows we discussed that belief in magic? Magic is real, folks. I have seen it work. It is not to be played with or laughed at or scoffed about. It is dangerous, extremely dangerous. The myriad Gnostic gems or inscribed stones decorated with serpents, Kabbalistic names, and the rest are more likely to be proofs of initiation and talismans than mere identification tokens presented to ensure admission to meetings, as some authors have thought. The reason for supposing this is that, one, the gems are very similar in many respects to talismans in use by other communities including the Egyptians, and two, they can often be interpreted as containing magical messages or diagrammatical invocations. Ethically speaking, Gnostic belief is that there are two principles, that of good and evil. A balance must be struck between these forces, and the balance is in the hands of the Gnostic, the knower, partly because nobody else can tell whether an action is for the eventual good of the individual or the community. And this secret knowledge comes through the mystical insights which the supermen Gnostics attained. There's that reference to a super race or a superman again, which always crops up with these people, as it did with Hitler and many others. The rise of individuals who wrongly believed that they had attained to Gnosis, all knowledge, some of whom were leaders of Gnostic society, produced very notorious characters. Those who followed the way of the Ophite branch glorified the serpent who tempted Eve, and they still do that today. They did this because this snake, by his actions, brought knowledge into the world, gave man the gift of intellect, the use of which will bring him to the state of apotheosis, where man himself will be God. Basilides was a leader who taught that Jesus did not die on the cross. And you will see this crop up all through the history of the mystery schools, even in the ninth temper. Since matter and material things were considered to be a part of the inferior non-spiritual world, the sect known as the Canaanites called upon everyone to destroy those things which belonged to the world. And they called themselves the destroyers, and their god is the destroyer. These deviations 
and the barons have attracted the greatest attention, as is natural, and the quieter teachers of the creed have received less attention. The pious horror with which the less respectable Gnostics were viewed by the early Christian fathers has stamped itself forever on Western literature and belief about the, quote, enlightened ones, unquote. But in more than one place in the Middle East, as well as in small groups in Western Europe, there are still followers of various schools of Gnosticism. They mainly follow the ideas held by Valentinus, with some variations. And this school teaches its initiates that matter is more evil than good, that man must be purified by mental concentration, that after death man will rejoin that from which he has been severed and will be unified with those whom he loves in the great intelligence. They also believe that all matter will eventually be destroyed by fire. And if they have their way, that could be absolutely true. The Mandeans, a small but tenacious community which dwells in Iraq, follow an ancient form of Gnosticism, which practices initiation, ecstasy, and some rituals which have been said to resemble those of the Freemasons, and of course they do, because they are. <laughs> In every Masonic temple you will see somewhere up on the wall a big letter G, and you will see it in their symbology, in their books, you will see this letter G. And if you ask a Freemason, being bound to the oath never to tell you or reveal the secrets, to the profane, which is what they call those who are not initiates or adepts in the mysteries. He will tell you that it stands for God, but that is a lie. It does not stand for God, for I have researched it deeply all the way up the ladder of the stages of initiation. And at the top, those adepts known as the priesthood know this large letter G to represent Gnosticism, and it is an admission that they are indeed the recipients of the ancient Gnostic. They are Gnostics, and they are looking to attain the Gnosis, through which they will receive apotheosis. And they believe that they are the only ones in the world who possess truly mature minds, and thus are the only ones in the world capable of ruling the rest of us, whom they refer to as cattle. Cattle. Well, it's time to take a break, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this very short pause. That was Overture to Sleuths, conducted by Eric Kunzel, the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra. Cincinnati is the home of the Order of Cincinnatus and the Knights of the Golden Circle. You see, everything that I do on this show has meaning, even the music, folks. Now, whether you like the music or not makes no difference. Listen to the words. Research the title. Try to find out what the music means before you condemn it. And remember that you're not the only one out there. Your age group is not the only age group listening. So whether you like the music or not, it doesn't make any difference. It all has a message. It all has a message, folks. And I hope you get the message, for it is extremely important that you do. A most detailed account of what was said to be the seven highest degrees of secret Egyptian initiation was first published in Germany in the 18th century. This strange and very exhaustive document combines many elements from the ancient mysteries. It seems to come from Greek sources because many of the words used are Greek. And it could well be that we have here the modern beginnings of an attempted revival of ancient mysteries. 
Whatever it is, it is not one of those fanciful and spurious ones which used to be printed merely to attract the credulous, because it is plausible in containing the sort of material which might well have formed the content of an initiation and mind-conditioning system. And if you understand the secret religions as I do, and specifically the modern ones, you will quickly recognize this as authentic. The earliest version known is in the form of an anonymous pamphlet, probably not intended for public sale, of 30-odd pages printed in 1785. <laughs> right in that area of history is momentous occurrences. It was republished in a French translation 30 years later purporting to be the ritual of the Master Degree in Freemasonry. And if you know anything about the Master Degree in Freemasonry, you will soon see that it certainly <laughs> is exact in its descriptions. The French editor claims that it is a composite ritual derived from the works of some 15 Greek and Roman writers. This degree, we are told, was open to Egyptian kings and priests alone and only those specially recommended by an initiate could enter it. The usual procedure was that the pharaoh himself introduced the candidate to the priest. By them he was sent from Heliopolis, the city of the sun, and you'll never escape from the sun when you're studying the mysteries, to the Memphis priests. From there he went to Thebes. He was circumcised, forbidden to eat pulch or fish, and generally had to abstain from wine. He was put for several months in an underground cave and asked to write down his reflections. When he had done this, he was led to a passage supported by the pillars of Hermes, where he had to learn certain things which were inscribed thereon. As soon as he was word perfect, the Thesmorphus, or the introducer, came to him with a strong whip to keep the uninitiated or the profane at bay. He was blindfolded and his hands bound with cords. Now follows the procedure from the first degree of the select body. The candidate was led to the gate of men, where the introducer touched the shoulder of an apprentice, Porcophorus, standing there on guard. He in turn knocked on the gate, which was opened. When the aspirant entered, he was questioned on various manners by the hierophant, after which he was led around the Barantha, in an artificial storm of wind, rain, thunder, and lightning. If he showed no sign of fear, Minis, the expounder, explained the laws of the Krata Rapoa, to which he had to agree. He was then taken in front of the Hierophant, made to kneel, and vowed fidelity with a sword point at his throat. As witness, he called upon the sun, moon, and stars. And where... Have you heard that before? His eyes were then unbandaged, and he was placed between two spare pillars called batiles, where lay a ladder of seven steps, behind which were eight doors of different metals of gradually increasing purity. The hierophant, then addressing those present, as many Musai are children of the work of celestial investigation, extorted them to govern their passions and fix their thoughts upon God. Now the sun, the moon, and the stars, you should know by now, represent the doctrine, the church, and the initiates. The sun, of course, is the doctrine, the moon is the church, and the stars are the body of initiates, or the thousand points of of light. The candidate was taught, folks, that the latter symbolized the wanderings of the soul. He was told the causes of wind, thunder, and lightning, and given other valuable information, such as medical lore. He was given the password of recognition of this degree, which was, and I spell it because I don't know the correct pronunciation, A-M-O-U-N, meaning secrecy. He was taught a grip, given a pyramidal cap and an apron called Zylon. Around his neck was a collar, and he wore no other clothes. His duty was to guard the gate of men in his turn. 
The porter Horus was now able, after showing his devotion, to proceed to the second degree. Following a prolonged fast, he was taken into a dark chamber called Indemian, the Invitation Grotto. He was now of the degree of Neocorus. Handsome women brought him dainty food. They were the wives of the priest who endeavored to excite his love. If he resisted these advances, he was further lectured by the master of ceremonies and led into an assembly where the stolista, or water-bearer, poured water over him. Then a living serpent was thrown at him. The whole room was full of snakes to test his courage. He was then led to two high pillars between which stood a griffin driving a wheel before him. The pillars symbolize east and west, the griffin, the sun, and the wheel of four spokes, the four seasons. He was taught the use of the level and instructed in geometry and architecture. He received a rod entwined by serpents, and that rod is still used today by the medical community. It's called the caducus. And he received the password, heave, meaning serpent, and was told the story of the fall of man. The sign consisted in crossing the arms over the chest, and his duty was to wash the pillars. Now, when the initiate was initiated into the third degree, the member was given the title of Melanophorus. He was led to an anteroom over whose door was written, Gate of Death. The room was full of copies of embalmed bodies and coffins. Here, too, were a number of dissectors, embalmers, and so on. In the center stood the coffin of Osiris. The Melanophorus was asked if he had had a hand in the assassination of his master. On his denying the question, he was seized by two Tapic sites are men who buried the dead and led into a hall where he found all the other Melanophores clothed in black. The king himself, who always was present on these occasions, addressed him in an apparently friendly way, begging him, if he did not feel courage enough to undergo the test now to be applied to him, to accept the golden crown he was offering him. Well, he had already been coached to refuse the crown and tread it underfoot. At this insult, the king called for revenge. Raising his sacrificial axe, he touched the head of the initiate. And in one famous initiation, the king actually beheaded the man. The two corpse carriers threw him on the ground, and the embalmers wrapped him in bandages. All who were present wept. Now he was led to a gate over which was written, Sanctuary of the Spirits. Now the initiate was not supposed to be beheaded in that one famous initiation. And I don't know what they chalked that up to. Now, standing before the gate, the initiate waited. On its being opened, thunder and lightning struck the apparently dead man. Chan received him as a spirit into his boat and carried him to the judges of Hades. Pluto sat on his judgment seat, while Rhadamanthus and Minos, as well as Athan, Nicreus, Alastor, and Orpheus stood beside him. Very severe questions were put to him as to his former life, and finally he was sentenced to remain in these subterranean vaults. Now remember, this is an, in an initiation, which sometimes lasts for months and even years. The bandages were removed, and he was told never to desire blood, never to leave a corpse unburied, and to believe in the resurrection of the dead and the judgment to come. Now remember, this is long centuries before Christianity. He was taught coffin decoration and the peculiar hierogrammatical script. The sign was an embrace to express the days of wrath. He was kept in these underground chambers until thought fit 
to proceed to a higher degree. These, quote, days of wrath, unquote, generally lasted for a year and a half until the initiate was ready for promotion to the fourth degree. The Battle of the Shades. He was handed his sword and his shield and taken through dark passages. He met certain persons presenting a frightful appearance, carrying torches and serpents. He was attacked with the cry of Panis. He defended himself bravely, but was always taken prisoner. His eyes were bandaged and a cord placed around his neck. Dragging him into a hall, the specters disappeared. He was led into the assembly of initiates and his eyes unbandaged. Before him, he saw a magnificent hall decorated with beautiful paintings. The king and the highest dignitary, the demiurgos, were present. All were wearing their alidai, an Egyptian order composed of sapphires. Among those present were the secretary, the treasurer, and the master of feats. The orator made a speech congratulating the new member on his fortitude. He was given a drink called Sice, which he drank to the dregs. And this was probably the ritual drink of honey or milk, water, wine, and gruel, and perhaps some hypnotic drug. He donned the boots of Anubis, took up the shield of Isis, put on the cloak and cap of Orcus. He was handed a sword and told that he must cut off the head of the next person he met in a cave and bring it back to the king. This cave was pointed out to him. Entering it, he saw what seemed to be a beautiful woman, but in reality was a model of one. Now notice it's a woman. He seized this by the hair and severed the head. This he brought back to the monarch who praised him, telling him that he had symbolically won the head of the Gorgon, wife of Typhon, who had caused the death of Osiris. He was now permitted always to wear the dress which had been given to him, and he was entered in a book as one of the judges of the land. Notice that, one of the judges of the land. He was able to communicate at any time with the king, and received an allowance from the court. He was invested with an order, that of Isis in the shape of an owl, and it was revealed to him that the secret name of the great lawgiver was J-O-A, Joa, which was also the password of this degree. But the password for the meetings of the Christophori, as the fourth degree initiates were called, was Sassicus. The fifth degree, that of Balahat, could not now be refused to the Chrysophorus, if he demanded or requested it. He was led to a hall to watch a play at which he was the only onlooker. Other members of the degree went through the hall as if looking for something. One drew his sword, and the terrible figure of Typhon appeared. Of course he was slain. And now the due Balahate was told that Typhon represented fire, a terrible element which was at the same time indispensable. The password was China, and the teaching was in chemistry, or alchemy. In order to become an astronomer of the gate of the gods, the sixth degree, the candidate was taken to the hall of assembly, bound and led to the gate of death. He was shown corpses which had been cast into water, and warned that he might be similarly treated if he broke his oath. He was given some teaching in astronomy, and taken back to the gate of the gods, where he looked at the pictures of the gods while their histories were explained to him. A priestly dance took place, symbolizing the course of the heavenly bodies. He saw a list of members of the order throughout the world and learned the password Ibis for watchfulness. The last and the highest degree was that of Propheta, in which all secrets were laid bare. It was conferred following public processions, and when the permission of the king and all the highest members had been obtained, the members secretly left the city by night and retired to some houses built in a square and surrounded by pillars by the sides of which were placed alternately a shield and a coffin, 
whose rooms were painted with representations of human life. Now these houses were called Maneras, for the people believed them to be visited by the manes of departed men. On their arrival at these houses, the new member, now called Prophet, or Saphanath, Panka, a man who knows the secrets, was given a drink called Oimelas, and told that now all trials were over. He received a cross of peculiar significance, which he was always to wear. He was clothed in a wide, white-striped dress called Itangi. The usual sign was crossing his arms in his wide sleeves. He could peruse all the sacred books written in the Ammonite language. His greatest privilege was having a vote in the election of a king, and the password was Adan. These mystical societies always continued, and one of special interest is the powerful society in Afghanistan in ancient times called the Roshaniya, or Illuminated Ones. There are actually references to this mystical cult going all the way back through history to the House of Wisdom at Cairo. The major tenets of this cult were the abolition of private property, the elimination of religion, the elimination of nation-states, the belief that illumination emanated from the supreme being who desired a class of perfect men and women to carry out the organization and direction of the world, belief in a plan to reshape the social system of the world by first taking control of individual countries one by one, and the belief that after reaching the fourth degree, one could communicate directly with the unknown supervisors who had imparted knowledge to initiates throughout the ages. The Roshaniya also called themselves the Order. Initiates took an oath that absolved them of all allegiance except to the Order and stated, quote, I bind myself to perpetual silence and unshaken loyalty and submission to the order. All humanity which cannot identify itself by our secret sign is our lawful prey. Unquote. The oath remains essentially the same to this day. The secret sign was to pass a hand over the forehead, palm inward, the countersign to hold the ear with the fingers and support the elbow in the cupped other hand. Does that sound familiar? If you sit in a courtroom in just about any city in this land, you will see those signs exchanged between lawyers and defendants and judges. And you will see that whenever that these signs are exchanged, whoever initiated the exchange will usually, in fact, most often does, win the court case. The order, of course, is the order of the quest, and the cult preached that there was no heaven, no hell, only a spirit state completely different from life as we know it. The spirit could continue to be powerful on earth through a member of the order, but only if the spirit had been itself a member of the order before its death. Thus, members of the order gained power from the spirits of the dead members. The Roshaniya took in travelers as initiates and then sent them on their way to found new chapters of the order, and they were called fellow travelers. You see this order, as all before it, in all sense, are socialists, communists. It is believed by some that the assassins were a branch of the Roshaniya. And branches of the Roshaniya are the illuminated ones, are the Illuminati, exist and still exist everywhere. One of the rules was not to use the same name and never mention, quote, Illuminati, unquote. That rule is still in effect today, and that's probably the breaking of that rule that resulted in Adam Weishaupt's downfall. Remember, folks, that we have really only just begun, and you are just beginning to understand, although some of you may think that you already understand, I can assure you that maybe a very small minority of you really do. Most do not. We have a long way to go in this history and in your own particular individual illumination. <laughs> oh, I just love it. I just love it, exposing these people who claim that they're doing everything for the benefit of mankind, who really have all the guilt for most of everything bad that has ever happened to mankind resting squarely upon their shoulders. Now, if you'd like a packet of information, if you'd like to know how to join Kaji, 
If you'd like to purchase my book, or if you'd like to donate to pay for the airtime of this show, make a check or money order out to WWCR. That's to pay for the airtime. And send it to Stan, along with your request for information and whatever else that you may wish. Send it to Stan, P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Stan, P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Or you can call Stan and talk to him on the phone. He's a really wonderful guy. You'll enjoy it. Call him at 602 567 6109. That's 602 567 6109. Next time, folks, we're going to talk about the old man of the mountain. And we're going to continue the history of the order through the ages. Good night, and God bless you all.